In his book, A People's History of the United States, Howard Zinn told American history from the point of view of the powerless. You can't be neutral on a moving train, was his advice to his Boston University students. His latest book, Terrorism and War, dissects the first casualties of war, truth, civil liberties, and human rights. Next on In Depth, author, historian, activist, Howard Zinn. As an author, a columnist, and a teacher, Howard Zinn, what do you want people to take away from your writings? Ah, <laughs> I do want them to take something away, right. Yes, I guess what I want them to take away is the idea of being an active citizen in a, in a country that will be made more democratic as more ordinary people take part in it. That is, this comes from a, you might guess, a general distrust of, of authority and government and a feeling that they uh, very often don't do the right things and uh, that uh, I want, I guess I write history uh, in about social movements and about people uh, who are not up there on top uh, because I want people who read my work uh, to get a sense of the power of powerless people once these powerless people begin to think for themselves uh, begin to organize, begin to act. Um, um, I, yeah, I guess, yes, I, I, want, I want people to come away from my writing uh, not made more passive, uh, but made more active. I want to get into your 20 plus books, but I want to read to you what you said to a reporter at Harvard Magazine in which you said along these lines that my secret agenda is to precipitate social change. My aim, as you just mentioned, is to kind of provoke people to get active. My question is, how do you do that? Well, I'm not sure exactly how to do that. Um, but I suppose one of the ways to do that is to suggest by showing the history um, in which bad things happen when people don't get involved. Um, by showing how um, wars take place uh, because people have not been roused to protest war. Uh, in other words, to suggest by talking about what has happened in the past, to suggest that um, terrible things could be averted if more people uh, acted. Uh, and so it's not that in my writing I exhort people, say, get out there and do something. I'm trying to create a, a, a climate for people in which they think about the past in such a way as to say to them, uh, it's very important for people like myself to get involved. Otherwise, we may be heading for the same disasters in this next century that we have had in the past century. Is that one of the messages from this book, A People's History of the United States, 1492 to present? I, I suppose that's a very critical, central message uh, of this book. I mean, there's a lot of pages in that book, 670 pages, but, and I, I'd hate to say that you can sum up my 670 pages in a, a paragraph, but uh, I think it's true that uh, uh, the, the point of that book is to uh, tell the stories of ordinary people, of uh, people who are overlooked in traditional histories. Because traditional histories generally deal with presidents and congresses and Supreme Court decisions. And, uh, and, and when you read those traditional histories, um, what is implied is that these are the people, these important people are the ones who decide what is to be done and your job is to watch them or your job is to listen to them or your job is to vote for them which reduces your role as a citizen to going into the polling booths every four years or every two years. And, uh, and what I'm saying in this book is, look, 
uh, here is what ordinary people who are not presidents and who are not in Congress, here's what they were able to accomplish when the authorities were not able to, in fact, when the authorities were hostile to progress. I mean, when the, both the South and the North were collaborating in the uh, maintenance of slavery. And remember, the North has always been a collaborator of the South in the maintenance of slavery first and, and, and post-slavery, semi-slavery, racism, segregation. Uh, when the authorities are in collaboration, you see, then uh, the fugitive slaves are rescued not by any government officials, blacks who ran, run away from the South in the 1840s, 1850s. Uh, the government is not going to protect them. In fact, the national government has passed a law, the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850, uh, which empowers the federal authorities to apprehend escaped slaves and send them back to their masters. And so what happens then is that uh, ordinary people outside of power, black people, white people, some of them former slaves, others abolitionists, black and white. They form groups to rescue slaves. They break into courthouses. They break into jails. Uh, they spirit these escaped slaves away from the, their, you know, um, from the authorities who would send them back to slavery. And I mean, this is this is the kind of story that I tell again and again of ordinary people doing things that the government would not do. In fact, very often that the government is opposed to doing. I mean, if the labor movement is a, is an example. Working people, uh, the government has never been on the side of the working people. Oh, well, if there are few short years in the days of the New Deal when the government began to pass under the stress of certain conditions. Then the government began to pass legislation favoring labor unions, minimum wage, uh, unemployment benefits, and so on. But for most of American history, the government has stood on the side of corporate power and against working people. Working people could not depend on the government to do anything about the 12-hour day or the 14-hour day. Uh, and so they had to take the matter into their own hands, which they did. And they organized. They went on strike. And they faced armies and national guardsmen and, and hostile courts and hostile presidents. Uh, but that's how the eight-hour day was won. Now, that's how progress was made for working people in this country. If the working class in this country has a higher standard of living than working people in many other countries, it's not due to the kindness of employers. It's due to the long history of struggles, uh, risk-taking, that working people, you know, were engaged in. Who was Emma Goldman? Emma Goldman. Uh, it's interesting that you should ask who was Emma Goldman. You, you probably know who Emma Goldman was, so it's a rhetorical question. But it's, it's a rhetorical question is good when it's a question that a lot of other people might ask. Because I went all through my education, right? Graduate school, undergraduate school, um, never heard the name of Emma Goldman. And I would venture to say that most Americans by far in their education, up through college and graduate school, uh, did not become acquainted with the name of Emma Goldman. And yet she's one of the most extraordinary people in American history. Uh, she lived at the time, uh, well, at the turn of the century. She was a feminist, an anarchist, a labor organizer, um, she's an amazing woman, a speaker, a writer. Uh, she spoke out for the rights of women very early on, uh, spoke out for the, uh, well, the right of women to have abortions if they wanted to have abortions, spoke out for uh, the rights of working people, was arrested many times, uh, well, simply because uh, in this country, despite the Bill of Rights, 
so often in the history of this country, people who speak out, even if they don't do anything violent, if they just speak the wrong ideas, the police come in and break up their meetings and, and will arrest them. This happened to her many times. So she, um, uh, I mean, I became interested in her, I suppose, in the 1960s. I'd, I had, as I say, I never heard of her in my historical education. I read about her on my own very briefly, and then I ran into, at some point in the 1960s, uh, at some conference in Pennsylvania, I ran into a fellow historian named Richard Drinnen who had written a biography of Emma Goldman uh, and uh, called Rebel in Paradise. And uh, you know what happens when you meet people who write and then you leave them, you want to read what they've written. And so when I left Richard Drinnen, I went and got hold of his book. And, and I was astonished and inspired by this amazing figure. And so uh, yeah, I began to learn, learn more about her and, and read her autobiography, Living My Life, which is one of the great autobiographies of American literature. Uh, and uh, uh, began to g give her writings to my students. Anarchism is the kind of thing that uh, you rarely study in college. And anarchism has this, you know, caricatured description, you know, which is oh, anarchists, bomb throwers, anarchists, believers in chaos. Well, of course, that's not anarchism. Anarchism is a philosophy, a way of thinking, a very important way of thinking. And, uh, but it's not a way of thinking that is acknowledged in our formal educational system. No, you'll take courses in political theory, for instance, and you'll study Plato and Machiavelli and Augustine and Dewey, maybe even Karl Marx, but you probably won't study Emma Goldman or Bakunin, uh, Kropotkin. You probably won't study the anarchists. And so um, I, I would give her autobiography as reading uh, material for my students, and they loved it. I would give them some of her you know, essays on patriotism, on women's suffrage, on other things. And then at a certain point, I decided I would write a play about her, uh, which I did. We welcome you to our three-hour conversation, part of Book TV's in-depth series with Howard Zinn. Our phone lines are open at 202-585-3880 for those of you in the Eastern or Central time zones. And for those of you in the Mountain and Pacific time zones, 202-585-3881. We'll get to your calls in about 10 minutes. You can also email us our address, booktv at cspan.org. These are your words in this book, Reflections of an Optimistic Historian. You say, before I became a professional historian, I had grown up in the dankness and dirt of New York tenements, had been knocked unconscious by a policeman while holding a banner in a demonstration, worked for three years in a shipyard and dropped bombs for the U.S. Air Force. Those experiences and more made me lose all desire for objectivity. Can you explain? Ah, oh. <laughs> I think I can. <laughs> I'd better be able to explain. Um, well, um, I mean, the notion of objectivity never uh, appealed to me. That is the notion that... Objectivity as a historian. Objectivity as a historian or objectivity as a journalist or, you know, the, the notion that, that uh, you... Uh, that you can describe a situation uh, and not put yourself into it uh, and not um, uh, not have your own uh, interests and your own point of view intrude in what you decide to talk about or write about. I mean, it became clear to me from the beginning as soon as I began studying history that history is a rather arbitrary uh, or seemingly arbitrary selection of a small body of data out of an infinite amount of data. Uh, in other words, every historian, no matter how, quote, objective, unquote, the history seems, so the history seems objective if you don't see the author's point of view, obviously. Uh, if the author doesn't say, you know, this is what I think, or, or if the author doesn't get passionate about anything, if, if everything seems cool and so I say, oh, well, this looks like an objective book. But in fact, every history is a selection of information out of an enormous mass of material. And that selection must come from the 
point of view of the person who does the selecting, the historian. The historian must have a point of view. Uh, the historian must decide what is important and what is not important. And the, the historian decides on the basis of what he thinks is important, or even worse, the historian may decide on the basis of what other historians have thought is important. In other words, the, you know, if, if, uh, if uh, every previous historian has given a lot more attention to uh, Theodore Roosevelt than to Emma Goldman <laughs> uh, or, or to Mark Twain, oh, then you will do the same. Um, as a historian, you know, the tendency will be to follow the historical lead. So objectivity is, uh, to me, is a very spurious idea. Um, and, uh, and when I say that my life experiences uh, made me reject the idea of objectivity, because my life experiences gave me a point of view. My life experience, well, my experience growing up in the working class family, going to work in a shipyard, and uh, that life experience made me, uh, I would say, class conscious, made me, made me aware that uh, the, the, we weren't all one big happy family in the United States. You know, and we, despite the, you know, the words of the Constitution and the preamble, we the people of the United States, no, uh, we the people of the United States uh, were not uh, all of one interest. There were people who were very rich, and there were people who were poor, and there were a lot of nervous people in between. And uh, so I grew up class conscious. Uh, and uh, yes, with that point of view, with the point of view that, that there are a huge number of people uh, in the world, in this country certainly, who work very, very hard and have very little show for it. Uh, and that ran counter to the traditional notion that a lot of Americans grow up with, or the notion that is, that is presented to them that, oh, in America, if you work hard, you will become successful and prosperous. You know, it's the Horatio Alger idea. Uh, but from my experience, that wasn't true at all. Because I saw how hard my father worked, I saw how hard my mother worked, I saw how hard so many people worked, and how hard you worked did not determine how prosperous you became, how successful you became. On the other hand, I looked uh, up at people with enormous fortunes and uh, couldn't figure out what they did, uh, couldn't uh, figure out what contribution they made to society or how hard they worked. So, you know, I very, very quickly developed the idea that there was a kind of irrational um, distribution of the benefits of society that did not depend on how hard you worked, did not depend on how intelligent you were, that certainly did not depend on the contribution you made to society because there were all these teachers and nurses and hospital workers and sanitation people. I mean, people who did, farmers who did essential jobs in a society, the most important jobs in the society, and who weren't rewarded as well as, you know, CEOs of advertising firms, you know, advertising dog leashes or whatever. So I, I early on developed a, a crit critical view of our economic system. Uh, so I was not going to be objective uh, about uh, issues of class. Uh, I was going to be uh, conscious in my writing history that I wanted to bring out this notion of class conflict in history and bring out the important role of working people and the struggles that they, that they went through. Um, and similarly with my other experiences. Um, and, uh, well, I, I, yes, I was in a war. Um, I was a bombardier in the, uh, in the Air Force. And World War II? World War II, yeah. yeah. Uh, sometimes I'm... Uh, shy about saying what war I was in, but I, I has, you know, I have to rush to say what war I was in. Otherwise, people will think I was in the Spanish-American War. But uh, yeah, I was in World War II, and uh, and uh, I enlisted. I was a volunteer. I was an enthusiastic bombardier. I, you know, and I was imbued with all of the uh, the all of the enthusiasm that yes, people in this country had about fighting against fascism. And indeed, uh, fascism, you know, needed to be in some way defeated. 
And yet, I came out of that w war experience with a very complicated view of World War II. That is, it wasn't simple. It wasn't simply that they were the bad guys and we were the good guys. That is, it, it quickly became apparent to me that the fact that you were fighting against bad guys doesn't therefore necessarily mean that you are the good guys. Uh, they can be w worse than you, but, you know, the, to put it another way, more specifically, fascism was, you know, the worst phenomenon on earth, and yet the nations fighting against fascism, leading the fight against fascism, uh, were no models of democracy and humanity. The British Empire, you know, well, the American Empire, we, because by then we were already an empire. Uh, the Russian Stalinist, you know, um, dictatorship. Uh, these were the, the organizations fighting against fascism. Uh, these, these organizations did not have as their first motive humanitarian ones. They wanted to defeat fascism, but for their own reasons. And reasons had to do with power and profit and, and influence and so on. And so in the course of the war, terrible things happened. Atrocities were committed on, by our side. Uh, and uh, I wasn't aware of that when I was dropping bombs. I didn't think about that issue. I didn't think about where we were bombing, what we were bombing. Uh, it's, it became clear to me that what happens very often is you decide at the outset, you decide at the beginning, they're wrong and you're right. And once you make that decision, you don't have to think anymore. When, once the decision was made that we were the good guys, we could do anything we want. We don't, don't question anything. We could bomb Dresden and kill 100,000 people in one night. We can kill a lot of innocent people. I mean, after all, there are a lot of innocent people in Germany, although some people doubt that. You know, but there are, you know, in countries that do terrible things, most of the people in that country are victims of the leaders who do those terrible things, even though they're drawn along and, and you know, may go. So, you know, World War II uh, started out with our side protesting the terrible things that the fascist governments were doing, bombing civilian populations. You know, which they did, you know, in, well, starting in, in, the, in Ethiopia with Italy, dropping bombs on, on, you know, people who had spears, you know, and, and then the Spanish Civil War, the bombing of Madrid and Guernica and so you no, know, and then, of course, you know, the Hitler and, the, and so we, we were aghast at that and horrified, you know, look what they're doing, the, the fascist brutality. And then as the war progressed, we began doing the same sort of thing, and even on an even larger scale. You know, you know, Hamburg and Dresden, I mean, uh, and people should read Kurt Vonnegut's book, Slaughterhouse Five, you know, for, you know, an artistic view, a, a poetic view of the Dresden bombing. And, and, uh, and of course, then Hiroshima and Nagasaki and Tokyo, which, it's interesting, a lot of Americans do know about Hiroshima and Nagasaki, but how many Americans know that in one night, not with an atomic bomb, but with fire bombs, we killed probably 100,000 people in Tokyo in the spring of 1945. So, uh, and then I participated myself in an air raid near the end of World War II, which at the time, I just went along like people go along in, in the military. Uh, and we bombed a little town on the Atlantic coast of France for no reason at all that had to do with winning the war, because the war was already won, the war was almost over, and we dropped napalm, the first use of napalm in the European theater. Uh, you know, and how many thousands of people died? Don't know. Devastated the area, because there were some Germans hanging out waiting for the war to end. We have some pictures of your home in Auburndale, Massachusetts, about 20 miles west of Boston. Yeah. Is that where you do most of your writing? Uh, yes, it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I was trying to think, where else do I write? Probably, no, that's where, yeah, that's where I write, yeah. Is there a time of day that you find yourself most productive? I'm not one of these uh, writers who gets up at five. You, know, you, you, you read a lot of stories like that, writers. I get up at five, I write until 12. <laughs> no. I probably get up at 12. No, I don't. But I, I don't, it takes me a long time to get started in the morning. I is, work that, is that your wife? At night. 
uh, I, I can't really see very well, but if it's a woman hanging around in my house, it's probably my wife. Uh, <laughs> I actually, yeah, the, the, the light is in my eyes, so I, I can't see. But I'll take your word for it that this woman is in my house and is probably my wife. Has and she been influential in the way you write? Very. The most influential person. My wife is a, uh, is a great reader of literature. Um, not claiming that my work is literature, but, she, she, you know, my wife grew up as a teenager reading, you know, Dostoevsky and Tolstoy, and she loves, you know, George Eliot and Henry James and Jane Austen, and, and, uh, sh and she's a wonderful critic, and she's the only person who reads what I do. I know there are writers who will, s you know, send their stuff out to, you know, 12 different people to get reactions, but I don't trust <laughs> the reactions of all these other people. Uh, you know, everybody, it's very subjective, the reaction to, to writing, but I trust my wife's writing. And, and so she's the only one who reads my stuff, and, and she will tell me, you know, this is ridiculous. <laughs> and, 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 you know, and, and, uh, and you can express this better, and so on. She has a very good sense of what good writing is. And also, she, uh, there's certain crucial moments when she provoked me to write things that I wouldn't have written otherwise. And probably the best instance of that is A People's History of the United States, which is, you know, I, I guess my most important book, not just because it's the fattest, but uh, because it's, uh, um, yeah, I guess it's better known than any of my other books. And, and I probably wouldn't have written it if not for my wife, who, when I was starting out and I was discouraged, I thought, oh, who wants to write a history of the whole you know, country from going way back and down? I mean, too daunting a job. I, you know, I'm, I'm not that uh, ambitious or energetic. My wife said, no, you've got to do this. Sold so, over a million copies. It has sold over a million copies, but, you know, over a year, you know, it's, it came out 19, that's for roughly since 1980, 81. So, uh, but it has sold over a million copies, which is rare, I suppose, for a history book, you know, except for texts, you know, which sell, you know. But uh, it's, uh, in fact, uh, HarperCollins, my publisher, is planning an event uh, to take place to celebrate the millionth copy sold. Um, I don't know if anybody will hold up a copy and say, this is the millionth copy sold. If they do, it will be probably a fake, <laughs> but nobody knows who has the millionth copy. But, um, but there's gonna be an event in, in, in New York City in, in f February 23rd, at the, probably at the 92nd Street Y in New York, uh, to which Harper Collins is organizing to celebrate the selling of a million copies of a people's history. Other books by our guest Howard Zinn include Three Strikes, Miners, Musicians, Sales Girls, and The Fighting Spirit of Labor's Last Century. Also by our guest Declarations of Independence, Cross-Examining American Ideology, and The 20th Century of People's History. Let's get to your phone calls. Pittsburgh, Kansas, you're on Book TV. Yeah, thank you for accepting my call, and this is a very good program. Uh, I have read Howard Zinn's book, and I'm just in deeply indebted as a scholar and an academic myself. But really what I want to do is kind of, kind of question your notion of objectivity. As I explain the objectivity to my students, I maintain that it's really reporting the facts as they really are. And I think, of course, all of us kind of select which things we think is important to teach. And those people who claim that they're being objective or being value-free or any of that other stuff, I claim are really kind of lying more than anything else. That, in fact, you kind of make this choice about what you think is important. Uh, I just wish to kind of hear you comment on that, because I think your work is perfectly objective, and I certainly present it as such. Caller, where do you teach? Uh, I teach at Pittsburgh State University. I'm a sociologist. Thank you. Professor yeah, Zinn. Yeah. Well, I, oh, no, I agree with you that the caller, I agree with the caller that, uh, that if uh, a historian claims to objectivity, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's not, it's not a, a justifiable claim because nobody 
you know, can really be objective, unless you use the term objective, you know, in a different sense than, than the way I am using it. I mean, that is, you can probably define objective in a way that makes, makes it um, acceptable, you know, if you say, well, objective means, you know, not deliberately lying or not deliberately uh, omitting of information that goes counter to, you know, your point of view. Uh, being honest, in other words. But I think, I think what the caller is pointing to is this issue of honesty. That is, if you are going to do as I do, and I suspect this uh, professor of sociology does, if you are going to do as we do uh, and unashamedly uh, present material from your point of view, you should be honest about it. And, and you should tell your students and tell your readers, you know, I'm not claiming objectivity. I'm, this is my point of view. You are, going to, you are going to get a picture of American history from the point of view of somebody who has certain views about class, about race, about uh, war, you know, about dissent. Uh, and, and I think that honesty, you know, is important. And, uh, you know, I would tell my students the very first day of class, uh, I, would, I would say, this is not going to be a neutral class. Uh, this is uh, a class in which you are going to hear my point of view. It's not going to be a situation in which, and some of you, and, and I have had this experience of spending a semester or a year with a teacher, and at the end of the semester or the year, you have no idea where this teacher stands and the important issues. And no, this is not going to be that kind of class, I tell them. You're going to, you're going to hear my point of view, and I want to hear your point of view. Uh, and then it'll be interesting to get, a, you know, different points of, of view. And I would say to them, and of course this became the, the title of one of my books, You Can't Be Neutral on a Moving Train. You notice I use every opportunity to advertise one of my books. Uh, you can't be neutral on a moving train. Uh, and people have questioned me about that. Occasionally a very philosophically minded person will look at me very earnestly and say, well, now wait a while. Well, I think you can be neutral on a moving train. But what I meant, and what I, as I explained to my students, the, the world is already moving in certain directions. Things are already happening. Wars are taking place. Kids are going hungry. In a world like this, you know, um, to be neutral, that is to stand off and, and pretend to neutrality, uh, is to uh, allow things to go on, you know, as they have been going on. Uh, means not to intercede in a situation which is already moving in certain directions. Has it ever turned politically confrontational in the classroom between you and the students? Oh yes, oh yes, because I, I had, my classes did not consist of, you know, people who came to my class because they believed in my point of view. Most of the students in my class probably did not know my point of view. Well, maybe they'd, maybe they'd heard something, but I had large classes. You know, I taught for many, many years at Boston University. I taught a lecture course of 400 people in the spring and another lecture course of 400 people. And when you teach that many people, the, you know, the small number of them will probably already agree with your point of view. But many of these 400 were students from business school or the school of journalism or from the school of the arts and so on. So on. And uh, the, you know, the ROTC uh, students and, and so, I, yeah, I would get arguments, which I welcomed. I mean, I, I would hate to have a class where there was no argument. And there were always plenty of discussion in my class. You know, it wasn't like... Uh, you know, the, the Secretary of Defense saying, sorry, no more questions, <laughs> or sorry, no questions at all, <laughs> you know. And uh, no, there were always questions um, and, and, and arguments. Probably the, the greatest arguments were about um, class uh, and about war. Arguments about class, because a lot of my students came from successful families and they would say, well, well, you see, my, my father and grandfather worked hard and look, you know, they made it and therefore if you work hard, you will make it. And so that always led to a discussion of, the, you know, economic justice. And then the, the issue of war because you know, the idea of a good war is so ingrained in the 
education of Americans, the Revolutionary War, the Civil War, World War II, you know, and, and the glow of those good wars is brought over to cover every war in some sense, you know, and, uh, and they, they take advantage of the relative goodness of some wars to uh, make the most odious of wars seem good. And so the, the, the militarism and war are very strong components of, of our culture. So the issue of, of war and would always come up in class. I'd like to spend some time on that in a moment, but first, San Diego, you're on the program. Hi, thank you for having me. Um, first off, Mr. Zinn, I think you're brilliant. And uh, I just wanted to talk about um, the liner notes you wrote for the anti-flag album on the song Panama Deception. Um, one, how does something like that come about? And also, um, what do you think the state of music today and its ability to reach others on that kind of level or be some sort of uh, activist outlet? Hmm. Well, I, I wondered when I read those liner notes if anybody ever read them, and now I've found somebody who read the liner notes. Uh, and uh, how did that come about? I guess it came about because these musicians uh, wrote to me and said, uh, you know, would you write liner notes uh, for these songs, which are, you know, quite political songs, and, and so uh, I was happy to do that. Um, at, one, at another point, uh, Annie DeFranco, who is a, uh, you know, a great, uh, great favorite, especially among young people, who's a singer and also has strong political views, uh, Annie DeFranco asked me to write liner notes for something that she for CD that she put out, and I was happy to do that. What is a liner note? Oh, a liner note. <laughs> and uh, uh, is the, those little uh, um, things you get inside a CD, which you know tell you something about the songs, and uh, give you some of the background and context of the songs that you're going to hear on that CD. So. Uh, uh, the, well, the, the caller asked about um, you know the role of music and, and in I suppose in social issues and social uh, progress and so on, which has always been very very important, always very important, important for the labor movement, certainly important for the civil rights movement. You know, I, I lived in the South for seven years, was involved in the civil rights movement, and the, the, the music of the of the mu movement was powerful inspiration uh, to to people uh, and uh, and in the 60s you know during the Vietnam War you know Bob Dylan Joan Baez uh, Country Joe and the fish you know the uh, um, uh, all of these uh, you know of course Pete Seeger and before that Woody Guthrie uh, Paul Robeson the giant of, of a person in the field of music with very strong political views, and that's still true today. I and mean, Bruce Springsteen is a singer who has very, uh, who cares about what is going on in the world. And, uh, and you know, I, th I, I, mean, I mentioned Ani DeFranco, and there's Eddie Vedder of Pearl Jam, uh, who also uh, thinks very seriously about the world and, and tries in his music to express that. Music is, is very powerful support, I think, for humane ideas. Where and when were you born? Um, I was born in Brooklyn. <laughs> and uh, I don't know why Bro the word Brooklyn always brings a laugh. Well, at least it brings a laugh for me. Uh, and I th because Brooklyn has always been this very sort of a place that for, that for some reason brought laughter. And, and uh, you'd have to try to uh, analyze that carefully to figure out why. People from Brooklyn laughed at it too. Like the Brooklyn Dodgers were always the most laughable team, you know. Uh, and, uh, but yeah, born in Brooklyn, born, you know, in, in the, worst, the worst parts of Brooklyn. Uh, and uh, when, you ask when, that's oh. a roundabout way of asking That's your age. In 1922, <laughs> people have to do the mathematics. So you're 80 but, years old. But people, yeah, but people can figure that out by, by right, if they know I was in World War II, they know I wasn't in World War II at the age of seven, right? So people can usually figure out my age. Um, 
but um, you know, I, I don't make a big thing of it, you know, because you know who cares? Well, some people do um, about about age. You know, age is a you know kind of construct, and and um, and sometimes it's relevant, and a lot of times it's not. Louisville, Kentucky, for Howard Zinn. Good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I've just recently been given uh, Mr. Zinn's book uh, by Miss Ann Brayton. It's from the Kentucky uh, Alliance. Uh, here in Louisville, we have a big problem with police misconduct. Uh, I find your book fascinating. Um, I'm on the chapter, Tyranny is Tyranny. I kind of wish you would have headed it, Terrorism is Terrorism. Um, I kind of find your book sort of also being complimentary to Jared Diamond's Guns, Germs, and Steel, uh, and how the American society in the very beginning actually survived and only survived through their tyranny. Um, I'd like to, you, if you could possibly, uh, tie America's history into the present. Uh, I haven't finished your book, uh, unfortunately. You may have already done that. Uh, but if you would uh, kind of show maybe how police misconduct, racial profiling, many of the crimes that are being committed against African Americans and other minorities in our society. Um, my brother was just recently murdered here in the city. Um, and the media demonizes the poor and uh, sort of glamorizes those who commit the crimes against the poor. I would like you to, if you could please uh, tell society why this is going on and, and what needs to be done to stop it. Thank C you. Caller, before we get a response, what happened in your brother's situation? Uh, he was killed uh, by the police here in the city of Louisville. Uh, under what circumstances? Well, it was somewhat of a routine uh, a stop due to some complaints. Uh, he had also had a history of mental illness. Uh, I can also see how they can also be tied into the situation here in America. And when did this take place? It, take, it took place uh, the 22nd of uh, August, uh, a few weeks ago. And there's a rally, sort of a forum being held today to discuss this topic. Uh, the Reverend Lewis Coleman, he will be present. Very other individuals will be present who have fought this struggle in the city for a very, very long time. And, and, and it really needs to be addressed. Uh, like I said, it's just it's mind-boggling how I could be giving your book a week ago, see you on television, have the opportunity to speak to you thanks to C-SPAN. Uh, but uh, I can tell that you are a very, very insightful man. And, uh, you know, we need more people like you out here to speak the truth and to tell the truth and not be afraid to tell the truth uh, why America suffers the way that she does. Well, that's, uh, that's uh, thank you very much. That's a, you know, quite remarkable a statement uh, and uh, made especially poignant because of this experience you went through with your brother just just very very recently and uh, you know I, I hope that uh, my history uh, makes people think uh, not just about the past but about what is going on today and uh, you know what you describe what happened to your brother is uh, something that happens much, much too often in our society. And, and that is, you know, police brutality, police killings, uh, the uh, uh, shooting of people, maybe they're mentally ill, maybe they made uh, the wrong gesture, maybe they said the wrong thing. Uh, you know, police brutality is, is you know, one of the probably least publicized things in our society and is presented as an aberration or something oh it happens just once in a while but actually uh, all over the country and and I'm not condemning all policemen because you know pol sure the police do useful things in a society but there's something in the police culture which uh, disposes uh, policemen with guns under certain situations uh, to use those guns and, uh, and those guns are used most often against poor people, and they're used most often against people of color. Uh, we've seen too many, too many examples of that happening. And what happens in police stations, and what happens between policemen and the people they arrest, very often is out of sight of the public. And, uh, 
and terrible things go on. And you know, when, you know, what does it come out of? It comes out of a, a culture of, of violence, a culture in which the government has all, all these weapons and tends to use them. There's a kind of parallel between the, the trigger-happy uh, policeman and the trigger-happy uh, United States government. In this book, The Future of History, you talk about Jimmy Barrett, who is behind bars in Colorado, and you say, quote, there are some extraordinary human beings behind bars who should not be there. Who was Jimmy Barrett? Jimmy Barrett, uh, as, as you were saying here, as you were reading extraordinary people behind bars, yes, a lot of extraordinary people behind bars, uh, and uh, Jimmy Barrett was somebody I met uh, oh, in the 1970s. He was in the Charles Street Jail in, in Boston at that time. Uh, at an, as a teenager, he had, he had been convicted of murder. Uh, actually, uh, it was a, a really a case of self-defense against some local sort of thug who was brutalizing him. And, uh, and uh, I'm not defending the murder, but indicating that the circumstances under which this took place and the fact that although it was a case of self-defense he had poor counsel and and so he was found guilty and he was given uh, you know a very 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 long prison sentence and he'd already been in prison 12 years when I began visiting him weekly uh, under the guise of, uh, of educating him but when I say the guys I mean he was educating me uh, he was a working-class kid who uh, began to read this happens a lot. Uh, people without education, they go to prison, they begin to read and read and read. And he read a lot and he began to write and was a wonderful writer. And we became friends and we've been friends for a very long time now. Uh, and when I visited him in his prison in, in Colorado, one of these uh, very bizarre places, uh, maximum, maximum security prisons. I mean, prisons are, are the... Um, you know, the invisible fascism in our country. I mean, prisons are places where terrible things go on which the public does not know about. And, you know, I've, you know, I've never served time in prison. I mean, I've been arrested in demonstrations and, and spent, you know, I've been arrested probably ten times and spent a night. And all you have to do is spend a day in a jail and prison and you get at least a sense of the fact that once you're in prison, and you may have committed a crime, or you may not have committed a crime, or you may have committed a crime and given some grotesque sentence by a judge, and uh, uh, but for you know, whatever reason, once you're in prison, you are helpless. Anything can be done to you, and the outside world will not know about it. To this day, uh, you know, I carried on this long correspondence with Jimmy Barrett while he was in prison. Now he's out, finally, after all these years. Uh, wonderful person. What's he doing? He's working at various jobs, uh, construction jobs, painting jobs, social work jobs, working with kids. You know, you know people who commit uh, crimes very often, a few years later, they're totally different people. They would not commit such a crime again. And, and it's a crime then on the part of society to keep them in prison for another 20 or 30 you know, years. But our justice system is a, is a very um, cruel system. It keeps, I mean, and we have, you know, we have so many examples. I mean, not just of people whose innocence has been proved, but even people who have been guilty of a crime but who, you know, they did something at the age of 18, and, and, you know, as I say, a few years later, they would never do such a thing again. They're no, no threat to society, but they're going to be there for the rest of their life. I mean, I'm in correspondence with several prisoners, one, Tio Atala Sala L, in a prison in Pennsylvania, serving a, a life sentence. He, as he says, he will die in prison. A wonderful person, a musician, a person of compassion. He committed a crime a very long time ago. He would never do such a thing again, but he's, there he is. Uh, Another book by our guest Howard Zinn, The Zinn Reader, Writings on Disobedience and Democracy. Our next call is from Ketchum, Idaho. Hello. Hello. Good afternoon, caller. Yes, thank you for taking my call. I'm going to change the topic from um, 
force and violence as a form of control and um, to the economic control. And uh, I know we've always had charities in this country, but under Bush number one, when his thousand points of light, I've seen a proliferation of uh, use of the 501c3 um, and now even the use of a charitable holding trust. Um, which has allowed, uh, in many cases, an elitist exclusive element to use the tax laws to legally get matching funds um, and from y using of tax write-offs. And I think this has vastly expanded the role of charities in this country. And I see that a lot of these groups operate in perpetuity with uh, big budgets and little oversight. Uh, their bylaws frequently allow a few to control um, and many times it's wealthy donors who give to each other's groups. And I wonder what you think of this trend, because I feel that in many cases it um, <clears throat> over the, for instance, when you see a $20 million painting has been donated, I think to myself, well, $10 million of that is tax money <clears throat> that's being probably given back to the person as a write-off, at least $10 million. And I wonder if Congress would have approved $10 million for whatever function that that $10 million would be put to, for instance, buying a painting. So could you please comment in, in depth, I hope, about that? And I just think you're wonderful. I wish you'd been my professor. Thank you. Well, uh, I wish you'd been my student. I'm trying to remember if I ever had a student from Ketchum, Idaho. <laughs> um, you're my first. But um, um, to answer anything in depth is tough, but I'll try my best. Uh, but you're pointing to something, you know, that you know is very, very important, and that is how the, our tax structure uh, funnels the money, uh, the wealth of the country towards the top, uh, and in other words, huge amounts of money are made legally. When money is made illegally, when fraud is detected, you know, for instance, you know, the Enron situation or the, you know, these other situations where they find, you know, actual laws have been violated, well, everybody gets excited. But people should get excited not just when laws are broken, but when laws are followed. That is, when the tax laws uh, give legitimately and legally huge amounts of money to the richest 1% of the country. I mean, for instance, as a result of the, the lowering of the taxes on the very rich that has taken place since the 1960s and 1970s, uh, the richest 1% of the country has probably gained over a trillion dollars in wealth. That's all legal. It's all legitimate. Uh, it's not called crime or robbery. Uh, it's called legislation. But, you know, uh, our economic, that's how our economic system functions. The maldistribution of wealth takes place through legal means, uh, by simply by the fact that the laws are passed by Congress, and Congress is most influenced by corporate wealth, and, uh, and it is the corporations who benefit from the tax laws. So it is going to take a citizen's movement of some great strength and persistence. Uh, to suggest that our tax laws should be very fundamentally reworked so that we don't have this accumulation of wealth where today, you know, one percent, the richest one percent owns forty percent of the wealth of the country, uh, while, you know, there are forty million people without health insurance and while, you know, there are mothers taking care of kids and who can't pay the rent and who can't buy food and people can't, you know, don't have a place to live. There's something really absurd about this. And it's not done by stealing. It's done uh, by law. As we take our next call from Syracuse, New York, we'll show our audience more from the home of Howard Zinn, including some photographs of his two children and five grandchildren. Syracuse, good afternoon. Hi, uh, Dr. Zinn. First, I just want to thank you for everything that you've done and all you're about. You're one of the reasons why I decided to further study history. And right now I'm working on my master's thesis and it's on the uh, Black Panther Party and re-examining their thug image, how 
Historians and scholars throughout history have referred to them as criminals and thugs and focus on the negative. I'd just like to know what you feel about the impact of the Panthers, um, their positive impact, how they're portrayed uh, even now and throughout history, and also when you have uh, people like Mumia Abu-Jamal and others who have been in prison partly because of their affiliation with the Panthers and political beliefs, um, just uh, what you feel about that as well. Thank you. Now that, that's, a, that's a very good question. Um, I mean, you're right that the Black Panthers uh, were portrayed by the government and in the press you know, as a, a violent group uh, that had to be suppressed. And, uh, and the Black Panthers, yes, they were a militant group. They, were, uh, they had very, very strong views. Uh, uh, the, the Black Panthers uh, carried out a lot of programs for the poor in the ghettos of the country. Uh, Black Panthers did not believe in nonviolence, and yet they did not really initiate violence, but they believed in self-defense, and so you saw Black Panthers carrying guns and, and, uh, and, and the image that, that came across to the nation was of, oh, the Black Panthers are a violent group, they carry guns and they use them, but the guns of, of the police were used against Black Panthers rather than the guns of the Black Panthers used against anybody else. It was, uh, you know, leading Black Panthers who were killed you know, by the police in Chicago in 1969, uh, you know, killed while they were asleep in, in, in an apartment and the police broke in, uh, fired, fired away hundreds of shots into the apartment and killed uh, two Black Panther leaders. Uh, and uh, Black Panthers became the object of the FBI, uh, which in, in its this very uh, Gestapo-like program of the FBI called COINTELPRO, counterintelligence program, which had very little to do with intelligence, but it had a lot to do with very illegal activities of the um, of the FBI, breaking into people's homes, breaking into offices, sending out uh, anonymous letters and and violent activities, you know, as well. You know, by the FBI, uh, in which they tried to destroy the Black Panther Party because they saw that the Black Panther Party was a was a, a group that was opposed uh, to the policies of the government and groups that were opposed to the policies of the government. Something which presumably should be guaranteed by the Bill of Rights, but groups which were opposed to the government uh, became the objects of FBI attention and FBI attack. Um, and for people who want to get a better picture of the Black Panther Party, I, I suggest that you know they read the, the memoir of Elaine Brown, who was the first woman head of the of the Black Panther Party. Elaine Brown, wonderful writer, uh, and uh, and you know it's it's something that happens generally to dissident groups in society, and that is they're caricatured. Uh, and so, sure, some of the things that dissident groups in society do are not right. But th what has happened is that the, these, uh, the few things that they do, which may be properly criticized, are made the whole of the attention. And the other parts uh, of the work are ignored. And this was true of, uh, you know, of the anarchists. Uh, an anarchist committed an act of violence my God, an act of violence in our peaceful society? Who else commits acts of violence? Only anarchists. But in fact, most, most people who believed in anarchists have not committed acts of violence. They've been organizers and, and agitators and speakers and writers. So, uh, yes, uh, you know, dissident groups tend to be caricatured and, not, and worse than caricatured, become the objects of government attack. Last year on this program, we talked with Studs Terkel, and you have a, a poster in your office promoting, I guess, a lecture series that the two of you had done in the past? Well, uh, Studs Terkel, one, one of my heroes, um, I have very few heroes in the White House, but I have a lot of heroes who are outside of the White House. Studs Terkel is one of them. And uh, uh, Studs Terkel and, uh, and I, and we've known one another for years. He was. Uh, I first met him when I uh, had written two books on the South, my book on, on the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee and my book, The Southern Mystique. 
And Studs Terkel was a, you know, a, a radio commentator, Ra had a, a very popular radio show in Chicago, and he, he interviewed me about these books. And that's when I first got to know him. And uh, do you mind my talking a little about Studs Terkel? Be no. my guest. Uh, he wouldn't mind, I don't think. <laughs> and uh, He was talking about you. Oh, oh okay, good. <laughs> uh, it's only fair, then. The, uh, but when Studs Terkel interviewed me about the, these books I'd written about the South, I was astounded because I'd been interviewed by a number of, you know, radio commentators. And, you know, the common thing is for the people who interview you on radio programs not to have read your book. You know, maybe to have some assistant give them a, a paragraph, a summary, you know. Studs Terkel had read my books very carefully. He'd never run at anybody who, you know, who interviewed me with such intelligence. And I have to tell you one more thing about him, which is a characteristic of, it, of, of him, I guess. After the interview, I went, I, I was staying in a hotel in Chicago before going back home. And as I was in my hotel room in Chicago after the interview early in the evening, and I got a call. It was from Studs Terkel. He said, what are you doing tonight? I said, nothing. He said, well, Ida and I, my wife and I, are going to a Pete Seeger concert, and we have extra tickets for you. Will you come along? So I did. <laughs> anyway, Studs Terkel and I, uh, I say, have known one another over the years, and a few years ago, he and I did a conversation on stage in Berkeley, California, the two of us just sitting in armchairs like you and me right now. Uh, it's always good to have comfortable chairs when you're being interviewed. And we sat on armchairs in armchairs on stage, and the two of us just had a conversation in front of this very large group of people in, in this auditorium in Berkeley. An email from Al DeGraff of Fort Collins, Colorado. He says, A People's History of the United States was mentioned quite favorably by Matt Damon in the movie Good Will Hunting. Was Matt Damon one of your students, and how did he develop an interest in you and your book? Uh, well, I'd like to say that Matt Damon was one of my students. Matt Damon went to Harvard, but uh, maybe he was one of my students, only in the sense that uh, uh, he and his mother, uh, Nancy Carlson Page, and his brother, uh, Kyle, were our next-door neighbors and friends for, for years, and uh, starting from when Matt was five years old. So we've known Matt Damon since he was five, and probably when he was 10, his mother gave him a copy of A People's History of the United States. And then when he went to uh, a high school in Cambridge, his teacher used A People's History as the textbook for their course. And so I suppose in that sense, you might say he was my student. And, uh, and, and, uh, and I guess he thought enough of the book. Uh, um, Maybe being given a book by, by your mother at the age of 10 is a strong uh, influence. I thought eno enough of my book uh, so that uh, when he and Ben Affleck wrote the script for Good Will Hunting, for some reason, and they didn't have to do this, I mean, I have to say in all fairness, it wasn't particularly uh, important to the story, but, but they, he, uh, in his conversation with uh, the, his a psychiatrist, his counselor, Robin Williams, uh, he, he, he looked around at uh, Robin Williams' books and he said, oh, you want to read a real history of the United States, read Howard Zinn's A People's History of the United States. Did you know that before the movie no. premiered? No. We, we went to the Boston premiere of the movie. We, uh, we, we were invited to the Boston premiere of the movie and Matt was there, and Ben Affleck was there, uh, Matt's mother was there. No, I had no idea, but uh, just before the movie came on the screen, uh, his mother, Matt's mother Nancy, came over to me and, and said, Howard, there's a surprise in this movie for you. And, uh, and, and it was. Ashfield, Massachusetts, for Howard Zinn. Good afternoon. Hello. Um, can I thank Brian Lamb for um, Book TV? I am a teacher, and I've gotten a lot of uh, good ideas, and I'm calling... Dr. Zinn for the same. I taught in corrections for many years, and I used your book, A People's History, um, and it was wonderful. I feel very strongly that students need to understand the social forces around them before they can begin to affect a change. I am beginning a new job teaching inner city kids. Um, as a SPED teacher, I'm working with kids who didn't pass uh, the Massachusetts 
uh, minimal standard and have to do this. It's called an MCAS test. Um, I'm really looking for some curricular ideas to help these kids think about the world around them. I really believe that I can't teach them until I engage them, and I'm not going to engage them unless I teach them something that matters. So I'm calling to ask you for any ideas. And by the way, I've heard you speak before, and um, I gave your book to my son, too. <laughs> He's a teacher. Thank you. Uh, well, let me first say that, that uh, you know, I'm so encouraged by the existence of teachers like this, teachers who are socially conscious, teachers who are not simply going by the book and, and using the old material over and over again, uh, and teachers who are thinking, you know, how are we going to bring up a new generation of young people uh, who are going to create a different kind of society? And I'm very encouraged, and I've seen this as I go around the country, and I do I, you know, go around the country and do a lot of speaking here and there. And wherever I go, I run into teachers uh, like this caller, teachers who are teaching in a different kind of way. That is very encouraging to me. I mean, it's, you know, it's, this whole business of, of being discouraged and encouraged is, is interesting. It depends on what you look at and what you pay attention to. If you only look at television, and you only and you see again and again the faces of the president and the secretary of defense and or congressmen and senators you know and uh, you know even on you know so-called public television you you see that well it's very easy to get discouraged because what these people have to say is very discouraging but on the other hand if you get away from television and you get out in the world and you see the this a whole new generation of teachers who are thinking and, and teaching in different ways well then you are encouraged and you think maybe there's hope for the next generation because i haven't gotten to answer this person's question about curriculum dodging that question of course but uh uh i, I have one suggestion which is which is basic about curriculum uh and and that is uh I would urge you to get in touch with, maybe you already know this outfit, an outfit called Rethinking Schools, which is in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, 1001 East Keefe Street, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, Rethinking Schools. They are a national network of teachers who, like you, like this caller, uh, want to teach in different ways. And, uh, and they may teach prisoners, they may teach inner city kids, they may teach middle class kids, but whatever it is, uh, they, they are looking for new materials. And Rethinking Schools puts out all sorts of interesting curricular material and suggestions. Uh, so, um, yes, I would, I would write to them, get in touch with them. And, and we have their website up as you speak. Oh, really? Uh, I'm not much on websites. But I'm glad they, they, they have a website that people can look at and, and, and tune into because they're, they're a great outfit. Speaking uh, of websites, by the way, if our audience uh, wants to get uh, a complete listing of the uh, 21 books that we've come across that have been written or co-written by Howard Zinn, log on to booktv.org. You can also get schedule information about programming on this network and booktv.org, one of nine websites that C-SPAN is responsible for and updates on a regular basis, including our main website at cspan.org. Long Island, New York is next. Good afternoon. Hi, how are you? Uh, Mr. Zinn, just wanted to let you know I love your book, uh, People's History of the United States. I discovered your book in uh, SUNY Stony Brook uh, by a professor named Jane Eli. Um, I graduated a, uh, with a sociology degree there. What do you remember from his book? Uh, <laughs> Dangerous question. <laughs> it, it's, actually, it's actually a really easy question for me to answer, and I could sum it up really in three words, and that's just the American ideological ego. Um, because that's really how I feel that the, the, the United States has the feeling that uh, we have this American ideological ego of being uh, so great and uh, the te history teachers try to teach us um, a lot of wrong things in school. But uh, I, don't, I don't think they're teaching us all the right things. But when you read Howard Zinn's book, 
um, he teaches you the truth, and uh, a lot of people need to read that. And I thank you for telling the truth. And what I really want to know from you is how you feel about what is going on in the U.S. today, the war on terror. Um, are you going to write a book on it? Um, how do you feel about the American empire basically being the modern Roman empire of today? Well, <clears throat> um, I do have this little book. You asked about, uh, am I writing anything about the, the war on terrorism? I do have this little book, um, little compared to my people's history, called Terrorism and War, published by Seven Stories Press. Uh, and uh, which uh, actually is done in collaboration with Anthony Arnov, who's, who's interviewed me, uh, you, you might say, led to this book. And, um, and, I've, and I've also written a number of things for the Progressive magazine about this war on terrorism, uh, so-called war on terrorism. And I've also written, uh, I wrote an article for The Nation a magazine not long ago uh, about the war uh, on Afghanistan and, and the human suffering we were causing in Afghanistan. Uh, so, um, so yes, I, I have written about it, but you, you, you're asking, well, I see two parts to your, your, your question, or I see rather a statement you make about, you know, the American ego, and then you ask the question about uh, my views on the war on terrorism. And, uh, I'd like to say something about both, actually, because the first point is an important one. Um, and you talk about the, the, that people are brought up in this country to believe, you know, America is unique. Well, well we are unique in many ways, you know. We are. We're, we're big, we're strong, we're powerful, we, uh, we, and, and we have a certain democratic rights, not enough democratic rights, and democratic rights which are very quickly suppressed in times of war. But, you know, it's, it's a remarkable country, but, um, yeah, there is this egoistic idea that not only are we different, but we are superior to other places. Now, he, here I'll, I'll quote uh, Emma Goldman, or paraphrase Emma Goldman, uh, about whom he spoke a, a little while ago, and she would give this talk about patriotism, and she would say, Yes, I'm patriotic. I love this country. I love the people. I love the mountains. I love, you know, I love so much about this country, but I don't love what this country does. I don't love its policies. I don't love what the government does. I don't love its wars. Uh, and, uh, and so, you know, the um, America, the, the word America stands for many things. And, you know, sometimes people reading my book have said, oh, you don't like America. <laughs> because I've been criticizing the government. I say, no, that's not true at all. The America that I love is, is the America of the, of the people who have stood for justice. And, you know, the, the black people have struggled for, the, for their rights, working people, women. And these, that's America. That's the, that's the America I care about. And, but the America that is represented by the government that makes wars or that he uses, you know, force and deception. No, uh, that's not an America I care about. So I, 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 I guess I think we ought to be careful about using abstractions like America or our country or our nation and distinguish, make clear what we mean by that. From the book, you write the continued expenditure of more than $300 billion for the military every year has absolutely no effect on the danger of terrorism. And then you go on to say that if we want real security, we will have to stop being an intervening power and stop dominating the economies of other countries. Well, that's, a, that's a, I guess, a fair representation of what I am saying about this, this war on terrorism. And, and the reason I call it a so-called war on terrorism is that uh, you can't really make war on terrorism. Terrorism is not a, a finite, identifiable country like Japan in World War II or Germany. You know, you can you can bomb it and destroy it and win a, a victory. You know, terrorism is an ideology. It come and it, it springs up everywhere, and it comes out of grievances that, uh, that people have, grievances that millions of people in the world have against American policy out of those millions, a few people will become terrorists. But if we want to do something about terrorism, 
we have to do something about the grievances out of which those terrorists spring. Eureka, California, you're next. Uh, good morning, Professor Zinn. This is uh, Pro Poet Dean Stanton. Uh, could you please comment on the viability of the Green Party and of the incorruptible uh, Ralph Nader as an alternative to the uh, Republicans and Democrats, the Republicrats? And also, could you comment on uh, Professor Abrams' recent uh, observation that 100% of these recent uh, child abductors and rapists and murderers and 100% of these corrupt, corporate, corrosive uh, uh, crooks, convicts, and 100% of the uh, priestly penis uh, pedophiles, and 99% of the school killing, the uh, co Columbine, etc., are white men, stupid white men, or white fascist boys. Two hmm. points. First, the Green Party. <laughs> uh, first, a green question, and then a white question. Okay. Well, the Green Party is, uh, you know, Ralph Nader, as you said, incorruptible. I mean, how could, can we say that about any other candidates of Democrats and Republicans who have such ties to corporations? And as soon as you get tied to a corporation, corruption immediately is inherent in that relationship. No, Ralph Nader, yes, has been an incorruptible uh, spokesman for the rights of people against corporate power. But way back from the time, you know, he took on General Motors and won and was responsible for important laws, safety laws, that have actually saved the lives of large numbers of people. What, what presidential candidate, what national political leader can claim that he was responsible for legislation that saved large numbers of human lives? So the Green Party, which you know, uh, espouses the ideas of, of Ralph Nader, which is basically you know a, th a third party that um, that uh, represents uh, environmental uh, s sensibilities and, and that wants to give the American people an alternative to the Democratic and Republican Party, uh, the Green Party, I, I believe, should be supported. And I believe that all political movements that are independent of the two major parties should be supported because they're, they're our only hope for changing the policies of this country. I mean, we don't really have two parties in this country. We have a and A prime. We have two, you know, countries that are so close together uh, in their policies that, that, in effect, we cannot say that we have free elections in this country. It's sort of interesting that we talk about other countries. Do they have free elections? Do they not have free elections? Well, I don't believe we really have free elections in this country when we're, we're confined, forced to choose between two parties, both of which are so close together in policies that are detrimental to the well-being of people all over the world and, and, and to our own people. This email, it's been said that democracy is not in the voting, but in the vote counting. Would Dr. Zinn put this last presidential election into as wide an historical perspective as he can with regard to the less than honorable vote counting? That from Antonio Samara. Well, well, certainly the, the you know the the vote counting in, the, in this last election was was scandalous, and and the Supreme Court didn't even want to move ahead and count all the votes. You know they wanted you know let's let's decide. You know Bush is president, even though we knew that we knew that Bush, you know, had not won a majority of certainly not a majority of the popular vote. And there was a lot of doubt as to whether he even won the majority of the popular vote in Florida. And, but uh, so, sure, there's a, a lot of corruption and vote counting and so on. But I think that is probably the lesser political corruption. You know, it's, you know, it's like what I was saying before about corporate crime. You know, the greatest corporate crimes are not outside the law, you know, when, you know, but the, the the crimes that are outside the law, the ones that capture attention, the greatest crimes are done legally. The greatest, uh, I think, corruption in our political system doesn't come from uh, what happened in Florida, vote counting, but the greatest corruption comes from simply the fact that our political system is dominated by money all the way down the line. Uh, the, the corporations with their powerful treasure chests which they can dole out to senators and congressmen and give to presidential candidates 
that is, is the great corruption. Uh, that ensures that the destiny of the country will be in the hands of, of the wealthy classes. We talked earlier about uh, Ben Affleck and Matt Damon. More from your uh, photo collection at your home in Western Massachusetts. One of the photos on the wall at uh, Howard Zinn's home as we get another call. This from Fresno, California. Good afternoon. Yeah, hi, Dr. Zinn. Um, I was referred to you a couple years ago, actually, by a new Black Panther member, so it's kind of funny that you had mentioned that earlier. Um, in the current state that we're in, as far as the social situation where um, we have this nationalism representing almost a religion where these people are dogmatically viewing the events of the world without intaking information themselves where they're getting all this stuff off network TV and they're not actually um, grasping things like through people like you or Noam Chomsky or Cornell West and your books that respond to the current situations of the world. I mean, how do you figure people like you and the other people that I mentioned play into the overall view of the young people in the world who can actually go out there in this world and make a change. Thanks, caller. When did you first meet Noam Chomsky, by the way? When did I first meet Noam Chomsky? Okay, at a certain point I'll try to get to this person's question, but I, I first met Noam Chomsky when um, we were on an airplane together. I had just moved to Boston out from the South, out from being involved in the movement in the South. And uh, I, while I was in Boston, things were still going on down there in Mississippi, mass arrest of black people, of civil rights workers in Mississippi, one of them being John Lewis now in Congress. And, uh, and a small, small delegation of people from Boston were going down to Jackson, Mississippi to try to investigate the conditions under which these people were being held. And I, and I was part of this delegation, and Norm Chomsky, and, whom I didn't know, but we found ourselves sitting next to one another and, and began to talk. And from that moment on, that was, you know, around 1965 or 66, from that point on, we, we, we've been friends. We, you know, we were doing the, as the movement against the war in Vietnam developed uh, Noam Chomsky became one of the nation's outstanding critics of the war and I became involved in in the anti-war movement and so the two of us found ourselves on public platforms again and again and we and so yes we uh, uh, we've been friends for a long time and to the caller's point and to the caller's point uh, about um, um, remind me what the call is. Well, he was talking about the divergent of views oh, where people oh, well, get yes. their he was opinions, talking about the, the control press. of information. Was, the, the caller was talking about the control of information. By the way, you know, or maybe it's not by the way, it's, uh, maybe it's a centrally important thing. Um, while it's true that our information is controlled, you know, the major networks, you know, I mean, C-SPAN is an exception. I mean, the, uh, this NBC, CBS, uh, ABC, all, in fact, you know, public television uh, will not put me on for three hours, <laughs> will not put Noam Chomsky on, will not put Barbara Ehrenreich on, you know, or Cornel West, or Manning Marable, uh, or Angela Davis, or, no, no, will not do that. So. Um, yes, information is controlled, and, and, and yet, uh, and this has always been true in, the, in American history, people who sought the truth had to go outside the official sources of information and outside the major media and had to set up community newspapers and listen to community radio stations. And, and there's something, you know, I think encouraging in the fact that uh, an effect is felt after a while. Right now, Noam Chomsky's book on, also on the war on terrorism, it's called 9-11, also published by Seven Stories Press. Noam Chomsky's book has sold, oh, I don't know, maybe 200,000 copies, yet has not been reviewed by the New York Times, yet does not appear on the New York Times bestseller list. Now, Michael Moore's book does, and that's, but that's a good sign. Michael Moore's book, uh, is, you know, and they can't ignore it, you see. 
a lot of people are buying it. It's, it's an anti-establishment book. Barbara Ehrenreich's book, which is a very class-conscious book about what, you know, uh, how uh, people at the down there in the lower income groups, uh, what their lives are like, uh, you know, in this so-called prosperous country. Her book, Nickel and Dimed, has been up there on the bestseller list. Those are all good signs. What they're signs of is that despite the attempts of the government and of the big media to control our information, we have just enough democracy in this country. And we're not a totalitarian state. We have just enough democracy in this, ju this, in this country, just enough apertures uh, of information uh, so that, you know, it's possible for millions of people to become uh, dissidents in, in this country. I mean, that's, that's encouraging, and that's something that should be, uh, you know, recognized less lest people become despondent over our failure to, to get information out. If you've just joined us, we are midway through a three-hour conversation with Howard Zinn, part of Book TV's Once a Month In-Depth series. Among the works by our guest, The Politics of History, also Marx in Soho, and a book we showed earlier, The Future of History. Our next call is from Baltimore. Good afternoon. Hello, Baltimore. Uh, Professor Zinn? Yes. Uh, I'd like uh, two questions. Uh, I'd like to know, as a progressive uh, historian, uh, what do you think uh, about reparations for the Holocaust of African enslavement? And uh, what do you think about the uh, future prospects for the resurgence of socialist democracy? Thank you. Well, okay, two questions. You know, one about reparations for victims of slavery and, you know, as there were reparations for, you know, people who were victims of the Nazi yeah, yeah, Holocaust. And, and the other question, um, the second question on social was democracy. on social democracy and uh, the future of possible democratic socialism. Um, but on the, on the issue of reparations, uh, I, I like the approach of, a, of sort of a, a black a radical intellectual named Adolf Reed on the issue of reparations. Um, reparations, the idea behind reparations is a very important one, and that is it's a matter of recognizing that uh, the wealth created by the labor of slaves contributed to the economic progress of this country. That these slaves created enormous wealth and yet they had nothing from it. Uh, and, uh, and therefore the idea of reparations for people who historically have contributed enormously and but been victimized by this system, uh, the idea is a good one. But as I recall uh, Adolf Reed's argument, and it makes sense to me, uh, I think it should be extended. Uh, it's most true, of, certainly, for black slaves. I mean, they were the most exploited, and th that was the, the most egregious situation. Uh, every once in a while, I use a word like egregious to just show that, you know, I, I was a professor, right? And, uh, but, uh, but there are others in history who also have been exploited. The, the working classes of this country, white and black, uh, people who may not have been slaves, but who, you know, were, were victims of the industrial system, the blacks and whites who worked in the mines and the mills, and who, you know, you know in one year, 1913, 35,000 people died as a result of industrial accidents. That, and, Oh, if, if you add up the number of people in this country who've, been, who've died as a result of, of industrial accidents due to the, really due in large part to the profit motive. Well, you know, the profit motive works in such a way, has worked in such a way that, you know, the, the, the machinery must grind on and the conditions of workers are not as important as making a profit. And as a result, safety uh, is second to the profitability of an enterprise, and the result of that being the death and injury 
to working people. Well, these people are exploited to too. Let me go back to that number because yes. I read it in one of the books. Yes. 35,000 killed in 1914, yes. 1913, yes. 700,000 injured. Yes. Some seriously. Yes. Where was the uprising? Where was the anger? Well, as a matter of fact, in those years there was anger. As we're talking now about 1913, 1914. And in those years, the, the, it was years before you know, World War I, there, were, there was a lot of anger in this country, which was represented by two important social movements. One was the Industrial Workers of the World, which was a radical labor movement, a kind of, in some ways, a predecessor of the CIO in the sense that they, unlike the AFL, which only organized skilled workers, mostly white skilled workers, um, the, the IWW organized everybody. Uh, one big union, they said. Everybody, black, white, men, women, skilled, unskilled, foreign-born, native-born, everybody who worked in one enterprise would belong, you know, to the union. And the IWW uh, carried on fierce uh, struggles to benefit workers' rights. Really, their aim was not just to get better rights for workers, but to create a new society. But they carried on very important struggles. I mean, probably the most dramatic of them was in Lawrence, Massachusetts in 1912. Uh, a Lawrence textile strike of 1912. Mostly women, uh, mostly immigrant women, striking against the great textile manufacturers of New England, with it led by IWW people, and winning their strike amazingly against, against these powerful corporations. So th there was ferment, there was protest against these labor conditions. The other, the other important organization beside the IWW, IWW at this time was the Socialist Party. Socialist Party. Uh, which at that time had uh, oh, uh, perhaps a, a million or two million readers of socialist newspapers. It had socialist locals all over the country. I mean, there were 35 socialist locals in Oklahoma. I mean, there were socialists elected as mayors of cities, socialists elected to state legislatures, socialists elected to Congress. Uh, Eugene Debs, the great socialist, the labor leader, socialist candidate, uh, a very powerful figure, Mother Jones, a member of both the IWW and the Socialist Party. Uh, so there was ferment, there was protest against these terrible conditions. I mean, it's, an, it's important to note that because today uh, we still have people dying in terrible accidents. I mean, we, you know, we had an incident in North Carolina some not, not too long ago where where p people died, where workers died, because the doors were locked, and they, they couldn't get out in the case of fire. Uh, and at the chicken, at the poultry plant. That's right, at the poultry, p poultry plant. And, uh, and, the, and uh, we still have s situations like this, where, where the conditions of workers lead to death and injury, and behind it you can see the profit motive operating uh, uh, ahead, of, uh, ahead of human rights. So, uh, today, when these things are still going on, unfortunately, we do not have as powerful a movement, which leads to the, actually to the second question about democratic socialism. The, the word socialism took on a bad meaning when the Soviet Union came into existence, because the Soviet Union announced itself as a socialist country, but it very quickly developed, very quickly developed into a tyranny. Uh, a tyranny that is foreign to the idea of socialism. Before the Soviet Union existed, we had the socialism of Eugene Debs, of Mother Jones, of Emma Goldman, of Helen Keller. A lot of people don't know that Helen Keller was a socialist. You know, of uh, Upton Sinclair, of, of Jack London, of Carl Sandburg, the great poet and biographer of Lincoln. We had socialism. Uh, we represented a wonderful ideal, the ideal of taking the wealth of this country and distributing it in a more fair way, uh, in a way that would benefit everybody. Um, then the Soviet Union distorted the notion of socialism, and so it to use the word socialism or say you were a socialist became a very difficult thing. Oddly enough, now that the Soviet Union has collapsed, I believe the chances for talking about socialism, a democratic socialism, not a totalitarian or bureaucratic socialism, but a democratic socialism. I think the opportunities for that are much greater now, and I think people should talk about that. 
it seems clear to me capitalism has failed. This email from Mort Paulson of Silver Spring, Maryland. Do you think that workers today are in general getting a fair share of what they produce? Well, certainly not. No. I mean, people can always point to workers who are getting, you know, fairly decent wages. Workers that are in very good unions. I mean, that's, that's when workers get good wages, when they are in strong unions. But most workers are not unionized. In fact, we have, you know, at this point, a very low percentage, maybe 10 or 12 percent of the American workforce in unions. And, and all those people who are outside of unions, I and mean, I mean, all those people who, who work at all sorts of jobs w which are not unionized, they are getting minimum wages, not enough to support their families. You mentioned Ben Affleck and Matt Damon, and, and a few years ago there was a rally at Harvard where Harvard students uh, organized in support of the janitors at Harvard who were n not being given a living wage by this very rich university, Harvard University, sitting on billions of dollars and uh, would not give workers $10 an hour, which are barely enough to, barely enough to support a family. Matt Damon and Ben Affleck came to a rally, and I, I was there too, the three of us, and, and workers from other unions spoke, and students spoke, and janitors spoke, and so on. Uh, but there are people like that. Uh, cleaning women in Los Angeles who went on strike a few years ago. If you see the film Bread and Roses, uh, you will get a wonderful picture of that strike. Uh, I just read today in the Boston Globe, uh, in this morning's paper, janitors are going out or voted to go out on strike in Boston because they don't have health benefits. So, no, working people in this country uh, are at the mercy of the market. You know, I, this, it's interesting how the the government and the press and you know and have tried to talk about the market economy as if it's a wonderful thing and have tried to get other nations to follow the market economy you know, uh, you know oh yes let let the market decide well if you let the market decide that means you are letting profit decide what happens Fairfield California you're next good afternoon uh, I wanted to uh, thank you, uh, Brian. I uh, appreciate what you do. Uh, Mr. Zinn. Well, I'm not I, Brian, but we'll <laughs> take the compliment anyhow. Well, thank see, you. Well, see, that's what I mean. You, you don't put yourself out front. It's, uh, <laughs> it's, really compl it's a compliment on how you handle yourself. Um, Mr. Zinn, I really appreciate your um, perspective. Thank you. um, I don't want to monopolize your time, but I have a few statements. Um, one is when I heard enduring freedom, I broke it down into syllables, and they are going to end our freedom, endure freedom. Um, another thing I wanted to comment on was that I'm a African American. Um, spent some time in five years in England and uh, probably 17 states here, and um, I am mixed with French, Native American, and and African. Were you in and the military, or what were you doing overseas? It was my father uh, that was in the military. I was mm -hmm. a military brat. And um, how old are you now? 37. And uh, the, the thing that bothers me about racism is that I could be more closely related to a police officer that's beating me than the officer that he's with because of the mixture. That just shows how ridiculous racism is. Uh, another thing that I wanted to uh, ask you about was that, um, you know, with the, uh, with the corporate crime that's going on now, it, it seems as though maybe more of the middle class white America and start to get a larger perspective on how our government views them and how corporate America views them. And that might help to bring about a positive push to, um, you know, maybe get our government back in a nonviolent and uh, productive way. And I was hoping that uh, you could comment on that. Well, that's, a, that's an interesting point about the, what's happening to the middle class, you know, because it's sort of generally recognized, you know, that, that you know, people at the lower rungs of society, you know, people barely subsisting, you know, that they, they would not be great supporters of the government. And remember, 50% of Americans don't even vote, and, and most of those are, are people, you know, with the, the low income levels of society, you know, who don't see any benefit for them from either the Democrat or Republican Party. But, the, you know, generally the middle class votes, and generally, you know, the middle class can has always been able to say, well, we, you know, we have some of the benefits of, of this very rich society. 
but in, in truth, the middle class has been given you know, just the bare amount of the benefits of this society, uh, just enough to keep them you know, in, in, in line uh, with the people at the very top who are amassing huge fortunes and who control our political and economic lives. But the fact is that people in the middle class have always been insecure. Uh, they've, uh, uh, they've always had to, had to struggle and had to worry. And, and, and now, and, and this is what the, the point that the caller, I think, is making, now the middle class, which has always felt secure, we hold stocks and so on, so we have a stake in the system. The middle class is beginning to see that uh, it, too, is a victim of the system. People in the middle class uh, may begin to realize that they have more in common with people below them than with the people above them. When that begins to happen on a large scale, then we will see a great movement uniting people in the middle class and people you know, of low income, of uniting against the people who run the society. If you could, just look at the monitor behind me, some family photos, who's who? You know, I, I, <laughs> the light is in my eyes and I, I can't, Oh, uh, that looks like my wife. I hope that woman sitting close to me, <laughs> yeah, is, yeah, is my wife. Yeah, it is, Rosalind. And uh, yeah, that, that's a very nice uh, picture of us. Uh, we've been married a very long time. And as you say, have all these kids and grandkids, which I says, some, says something about our relationship. And, and I did s catch a glimpse of a photo of her while watching while somebody is being arrested. Am when I was right? that taken? That w was somewhere in the 1970s and at Boston University when my wife was, came, was a spectator, I guess, at maybe even a participant at this anti-war rally, and the police were dragging this person. And you might look at that and say, oh, it's me, <laughs> because you can only see the back of the person. You might see my, that, that my, my wife is anguished because her husband is being taken away, but no. Uh, maybe she wouldn't be so anguished if her husband was being taken away, but she's anguished because a, some student is being taken away. I mean, that's the way she is. I mean, um, she feels what is going on in the world in a very deep way, and so she doesn't know this person is being taken away by the police, but you can see by the look on her face that this means a lot to her, that this student is being arrested for speaking out against the war. New Haven, Connecticut. Good afternoon. You're on Book TV. Good afternoon. Thank you for C-SPAN. You guys do a great job. And I'd like to also thank Howard Zinn for all the work he's done. I've read uh, your book, People's History of the United States, and it was uh, very enlightening. Uh, I especially enjoyed the part about the socialist movement, which you touched on a few minutes ago. Um, and i also like to comment about uh, seeking out alternative sources for information. We're fortunate here, but we have a totally listener-supported radio station with no corporate underwriting at all which is what introduced me to you oh, about 15 years ago and um, I was introduced by a conversation with somebody from the Labor Party and um, they when I contacted them they told me to read your book and get some information I was wondering if you had any comments on the Labor Party and where it's at and where it might be going in the future and I'll take your answer off the air thank you the, you know, the, the uh, thank you. The Labor Party, like, like the Green Party, is an alternative political movement. It's not a party in the sense that it puts up candidates, but it's a party in the sense that it offers an alternative from, a, from the point of view of working people. And working people doesn't mean just people who, you know, who work in mines and mills. I mean, you know, uh, uh, teachers and social workers and, and people in the medical profession are working people, professional people who are not owners of industries are working people. And the, the Labor Party is, is uh, just a few years old. It's, the, its founder, Tony Mizaki, uh, is one of the heroes of, of I think, uh, contemporary American history. Uh, you know, labor organizer, organizer working people all his life. He's, he's quite ill now. And, and uh, here, in fact, in Washington, D.C., there was a very nice story about him in, in the Times uh, last week. Um, but uh, he, he's, uh, he epitomizes the spirit of, of the, the Labor Party, uh, which offers people a, a way of, 
of dealing with the problems of wealth and poverty and the control, the democratic control of the economy, uh, which certainly the major parties have nothing to say about. I'm going to ask you to think about this next question, who you think is the most overrated person in American history. <laughs> Let's get a call from San Diego. Go ahead, please. Hi, uh, Professor Zinn. Um, I uh, probably picked up your book, People's History of the United States, like 20 years ago, and of course it was very enlightening, and myself have had some pretty radical political views. And my question is basically, having these views about the country and politics and being in a country where change just does not happen very quickly. How do you keep your perspective in really believing we can accomplish some kind of change? Well, uh, you know, of course, an important question. It's an important question because so many people uh, sort of have, I think, sort of the same kind of feeling that, that I, I get from your question, uh, and that is, can we, in fact, believe in the possibility of change when it seems so difficult to achieve change, especially in our time, that is, in this decade, and in, in this, you know, this time of Clinton and Bush and Reagan and another Bush. <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, very hard. It's, it's discouraging. But I think that's where historical perspective comes in. I, and I think we always have to think, you know, uh, beyond the, you know, the, the time that we're living in, which may be very discouraging, uh, and think that uh, in the, that there have been other times in American history when people also were felt, oh, change isn't taking place, and became very despondent. And, and just as they were saying it, a movement was growing. I mean, I'm thinking now, of, for instance, of the Civil Rights Movement. I'm thinking of the fact that, and you know, I, I was living in the South and teaching at a black women's college in Atlanta at Spelman College uh, from 1956 to 1963. And, uh, and in, the, in the late 50s in the United States, despite the Montgomery bus boycott of 1955, which at the moment seemed perhaps like an aberration, or just a flash, uh, but there was a feeling of, you know, racial segregation is here. And, you know, in fact, the people, you know, in this white segregationists in the South were wearing these buttons saying the South says never. And there's a feeling, well, what can black people do to change their condition? The white people are in charge and the federal government is collaborating. The federal government uh, refuses to interfere. Uh, even the liberal governments of Kennedy and Johnson are not, not really interfering with, with Southern brutality against black people and civil rights workers. And so there's a general feeling of discouragement. And then came 1960 and the first sit-ins in Greensboro, North Carolina, and then more sit-ins and more sit-ins and more demonstrations and freedom rides. And so soon you had a, a movement throughout the South and a movement throughout the nation and a movement that caught the attention of the world. And I, I guess, and you can see the same process operating in other cases. The beginning of the Vietnam War, who thought that, that the anti-war movement would grow to the point where the government of the United States had to take cognizance of it and consider and reconsider its policy of continuing the war. Because the, when people started out protesting against the Vietnam War of 64, 65, it looked hopeless. You know, a handful of people protesting against the most powerful government on earth. But the movement grew and grew and grew. And the truth is powerful. This is an important thing to keep in mind. Truth is powerful. And if, even if a small number of people using the few access, the few points of access that they have to the public, use these points of access, uh, the, the truth will, will uh, lead to the growth of, of a movement. Columbus, Mississippi, good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for taking my call. Uh, Dr. Zinn, I'm probably someone who, probably the only person I'll call today that has an uh, opposing view to you today. And I want to go back to socialism. And I, I, I absolutely oppose socialism altogether for the simple fact that to make everything absolutely fair, one must oppress the individual. Uh, could you answer my question how that is different than feudalism uh, in the past? Now, um you say one must oppress the individual. Uh, uh, 
I'm not sure what you mean by that, unless you mean that, for instance, uh, in order to distribute the wealth of the country more equitably and more humanely, for instance, we would have to have uh, universal health care with, with people not having to pay bills to doctors or insurance companies and so on, but with people's health care being taken care of for everybody, money not entering the picture. The only way you can do that is if that money comes from the national treasury. And the only way you can have a national treasury large enough to give everybody health care is if you levy huge taxes on the very rich. Now, do you consider that taking away the freedom of the individual? Uh, the, if, I'm not sure if that's what you mean. I, su su I suppose perhaps it is. But uh, I don't think that's a serious problem. I, I, don't, I don't think that, that uh, making the super rich less rich uh, is a serious attack on human rights and freedom. It's always a matter of measuring one against the other. What is a greater, uh, what is a greater problem in taking away people's freedom? Uh, people's lack of freedom to have health care or somebody's freedom to amass a uh, billion dollars or a hundred million dollars. It's always a matter of a choice. It's, let me take another example. You know, people, when the, it was finally insisted, finally insisted after, you know, Supreme Court decisions which said, no, you can't inter interfere with this, finally insisted that uh, public places must allow blacks to enter about uh, restaurants, hotels, uh, you know, and certainly government institutions must not be segregated. Well, you're taking away the freedom of a store owner to say only whites may enter here. Y yes, you take, and, but you have to consider what is, what is, a, what is a more serious, what is a more serious sin in the world of, of, of human compassion what is the more serious sin to take away the the freedom of the store owner to say that only whites may enter or the freedom of black people to go where whites go you have to make that choice let's take this next call from prescott arizona hello y yes uh, professor zen i uh i really appreciate your optimism i um in reference to you're uh, speaking about middle class. It's been my contention that the middle class is shrinking at the, um, with the growth of, of upper class and even the very much larger growth of the lower class, which uh, I think more and more people are, are slipping into without even realizing it. I'm 67, and the reason I mention that <clears throat> is that I remember when the middle class was the largest of them all. And I wonder whether these upper class people who seem to be gathering strength over what happens in our society understand that without a strong middle class, uh, there's nobody to fight the wars. Yeah, well, uh, I sure hope that there'll be nobody to fight the wars. Um, and, uh, of course, generally it's been the, the lower classes, the working classes, uh, and generally people of color disproportionately who have fought the wars. Uh, and uh, in the, the middle class is, you know, of course, is always seeking to move into the upper class. But, you know, as, as you suggested, more, more of them are, are in danger of losing their middle class status and, and uh, losing their, their jobs and losing their homes and, and sinking into more desperate circumstances. Uh, and I, yeah, I do believe that that we need to build a kind of unity between you know, the middle classes and, and those people you know, who are at the lower levels of society. 
if we, we are going to have a, a citizen's movement to bring about change. I asked you earlier about the, the most overrated person you thought in American history, and then we came across this email from a student at the University of Missouri, Tiffany, who says, given your refreshing focus on lesser recognized Americans, are there any politicians who you feel deserve their recognition and fame, and were there any politicians you find, find or found refreshing? <laughs> Some kind of a combo uh, question. There. <laughs> well, I'll start with your question, which is easier, and that is the over, overrated, overrated people, uh, most overrated. Uh, probably the most overrated um, is Theodore Roosevelt in, in the early 20th century, and probably in recent times, probably the most overrated is John F. Kennedy, uh, about whom a romantic glow is cast me, you know, partly because he was assassinated and because he was so personable and, and uh, witty and so on, but whose policies were really quite orthodox for the most part. But Theodore Roosevelt, I, I, I f fasten on Theodore Roosevelt as the most overrated, I suppose, uh, because he's up there on Mount Rushmore and, uh, and uh, hard to move uh, as a great icon um, of American history. Overrated because uh, what there too, you know, as I pointed out before, it depends on, you know, what part of a person's history, what part of a movement's history you select uh, in order to make a judgment. And, and you can uh, you look at Theodore Roosevelt as a, a believer in environmental uh, regulation, or you can, uh, you know, uh, nature lover, uh, uh, antitrust sort of uh, you can look, look at him that way, uh, uh, but uh, Theodore Roosevelt, uh, to me, is most overrated because what's, what's overlooked in Theodore Roosevelt is what is too often overlooked in our leadership, and that is their, their belief in war as a solution for problems. And in the case of Theodore Roosevelt, it, it wasn't even a belief in war as a solution for international problems, but he very flagrantly believed in war as simply as a wonderful uh, way of expanding the American empire. Uh, and so he believed in, the, in our war in, in Cuba, our war to get the Spanish out and really to get ourselves in. And he believed in a war in the Philippines, a very brutal war against the Filipinos in the early part of the century. Uh, um, and, and Theodore Roosevelt, you know, congratulated at one point a, a, a general, American general in the Philippines who had committed a massacre of 600 mortos, of 600 uh, Filipino Muslims in, on a southern island in the Philippines, a massacre of these 600 people, men, women, and children. And, and Theodore Roosevelt congratulated the general for a brilliant military operation, and Mark Twain protested against this. I mean, to me, the, there's the contrast. Here is, you know, there is Roosevelt and there's Mark Twain and Roosevelt. And of course, Mark Twain is hailed, but not as a political dissident, not as an anti-war person. He's hailed as a writer of, of great novels. But, uh, you know, Theodore Roosevelt, is, is, I, uh, uh, his overrating is, is, to me, a great miseducation because it, it educates Americans uh, to believe that uh, military heroism is a wonderful thing to admire. Uh, now, as far as the, this person's question about are there any politicians that, um, uh, that I'm happy with, it's very hard to find them. Uh, I mean, they're, they're, sure there are. I mean, t I mean take today uh, in Congress. Very few congressmen have had the courage or the wisdom or both to speak out against the so-called war on terrorism and to point out, you know, that it's, it's a war against people. The war we've waged in Afghanistan has resulted in the deaths of many hundreds, maybe thousands of Afghans without having any effect on terrorism, despite what the administration, well, you might say not despite what the administration says, but a matter of fact, in light of what the administration says, because Bush in the State of the Union address said, and this is after eight months of bombing Afghanistan. He says, there are tens of thousands of trained terrorists all around the world, a dozen countries or, or more. So obviously, the killing of those, that war on Afghanistan, you know, you know, you know, you know did not solve, you know, the problem. So, so 
the few people in Congress who have spoken out against this. I think of Bob Early of California, who's the sole uh, dissenting vote in the resolution that gave Bush his McKinney, a congresswoman from Georgia who is uh, uh, virtually alone. And here I fall to the Black Congressional Caucus. Uh, for, you know, I, I had hoped that the Black Congressional Caucus, which after all has this legacy of, of struggle for equality and struggle for the nonviolent movement in the South, had the legacy of Martin Luther King, who spoke out against the war in Vietnam. I was hoping that the Congressional Black Caucus would speak out in a strong voice against the, this so-called war on terrorism, which is a war on people. And by the war, war on, by the way, a war on people of color. Uh, although we generally are, you know, are willing to wage war against people of any color. But uh, Cynthia McKinney, uh, Barbara Lee, very, very few people in political life, but they, uh, these few people who speak out are to be admired, just as in the 1920s, Fiorello LaGuardia was a sole member of Congress to speak out uh, against the, for instance, the um, sending of Marines to Nicaragua in, in 1926, 1927. When did this book come out? Uh, that was my first book. Um, uh, LaGuardia in Congress, it came out in 1959. It actually was uh, based on my doctoral dissertation at Columbia University. And he served in Congress from when to when? He served in Congress, uh, well, roughly through the 1920s and until 1930, well, until 1933 when, ironically, when he was a Republican. He, he, and, and when the, Democrat, the Democratic sweep that brought Roosevelt into the White House and the Republicans out knocked LaGuardia out of Congress, even though he was the most radical member of Congress, hardly a Republican, really, in, in his spirit, although he ran on the Republican Party. He was also a socialist. At one, one time, he ran on both Republican and socialist tickets. We talk Connecticut is next. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, and thank you so much. This is a real pleasure. I have a couple of questions. One, I was, it, it occurred to me as you were talking about objectivity. I was wondering whether or not you could make a recommendation for, um, for reading about the beginning of the Cold War, and I'm especially talking about the, the Keenan document, um, so that um, it's really interesting as my daughter was looking um, up information about that period of uh, history, we grabbed several of your books because um, she was interested in your perspective. But she was unable to find anything, and so we're hoping that um, you might be able to supply some recommendations this afternoon. I'd also like to see if you could um, give a little information or give your perspective, perhaps a comparison between uh, the coup in Guatemala which was uh, driven by um, interest in the uh, holdings down in Guatemala, as the, as and the what is going on in the Middle East right now, which may also uh, have a lot to do with some of the interest in financial interest, whether it's Enron today or the United Fruit Company uh, back then. Um, well, thank you for the, those two very important. You know, Questions, you know. First, you talk about, uh, I guess, sources of information on the origins of, of the Cold War. Um, the writings of Noam Chomsky are very useful on that, and, and he's, you know, he's he's written, a, of course, a bunch of things, uh, and uh, and. Uh, I would certainly, you know, read his book, uh, the book that he and Ed Herman did, Manufacturing Consent. I would also read his book, Necessary Illusions, uh, um, and uh, uh, I'd also read his book, uh, uh, Year 501. He has a lot to say ab about the Cold War. I, I would also, uh, I suppose, uh, I, w I would turn to uh, Marilyn Young, who teaches history at New York University, and who, in fact, is uh, in charge of a project involving a number of historians uh, who 
uh, are doing research and doing writing uh, about the origins of the Cold War and about the, the, the Cold War itself. That's, you know, so you might get in touch with her, Marilyn Young, a, a Department of History at New York University, and I think she could give you a, a lot of uh, information, a lot of sources. How can people get in touch with you? Uh, well, I have an email address, <laughs> uh, hzin at bu dot edu. Uh, this, I, although I, I didn't get to this person's question about Gu Guatemala and interests, so I'll say something briefly about that. But you know, and uh, and you know, very often if you if you point to economic interest uh, uh, behind American foreign policy, there are sort of expressions of shock. What you know, <laughs> our foreign policy motivated by economic interest, but. Of course, it's been true for a very long time. I mean, that's what imperialism is about. Imperialism has always been about economic interest and expansion. And you know, and when we when we went into Cuba in 1898, it was there. You know, there was economic interest there. The corporations and railroads and banks moving into Cuba to replace the Spaniards. And and when we went into the Philippines and took the Philippines, economic interest was involved. The Philippines was seen as a gateway to the great markets of Asia. <laughs> Vietnam was although was presented as a war for liberty and democracy. Behind Vietnam, uh, you know, according to the memos passed among the, you know, secret memos passed in, by the National Security Council Department of State, they didn't talk about freedom and democracy, they talked about tin, rubber, and oil. So, uh, and today in Afghanistan, although Afghanistan itself is not a source of raw materials, Afghanistan is at the heart of the of the oil producing region in uh, in the Middle East and uh, the oil from the Caspian Sea and natural gas from that area and uh, I have no doubt that the war uh, that we waged against Iraq in 1991 uh, was a war basically about oil and uh, certainly we didn't go to war in 1991 uh, because President Bush, that is the elder Bush, was was just heartbroken over the invasion of Kuwait, um, as, you know, as if Bush was ever heartbroken about the invasion of any other place. After all, Bush himself invaded Panama, uh, and uh, <clears throat> so it wasn't invasion itself that did it. There, there was oil. Oil has always been at the center of our policy in the Middle East. Our guest's most recent book, Terrorism and War, which is about 155 pages. We'll get a call from Phoenix, Arizona, and show you some of the other works of our guest, including his latest, a play on Emma, Emma Goldman. Go ahead, caller. Hi, Professor Zen. Yes. Um, I have noticed that you haven't been criticizing anybody but Republicans. I am a Republican. Well, that's not the point of my call. I, I tend to be a champion of the, the downtrodden and oppressed and the, and the little guy, and I noticed that you are too. I'm wondering, what did you advocate back in the 60s and 70s in reference to the policies of, uh, that were instituted by the U.S. government on welfare and HUD? Oh, uh, were you suggesting that I was only criticizing Republicans? Well, I, so far I've only heard that, but oh, no. I, oh, I, I noticed that in the 60s and the 70s, oh. uh, the policies referencing uh, welfare oh. and housing and urban development, which were instituted by Kennedys and, mm. the, uh, and Johnson and Nixon, those are all failed policies. I'm wondering, what did you advocate back oh. then? Yeah. Well, let me let me put it this way. Um, I've I've always been a very very strong critic of the Democratic Party as well as the Republican Party, and I think I made the point earlier in this program that uh, there's not a significant difference between the Democratic and Republican parties. And in the '60s, when I was protesting against the war in Vietnam. I was protesting against the policies of Kennedy and Johnson, as well as later against the policies of Nixon. When I was in the South and involved uh, with SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, and was, you know, was writing and participating in the movement in Alabama and Mississippi and, and Georgia and so on, I was criticizing the policies of the Kennedy administration and the Johnson administration, the Democrats who were uh, looking the other way when the uh, the southern governments and southern police were arresting and beating and killing 
uh, people in the South who were in involved in a struggle for equal rights. So, uh, no, I, in, the, in the 60s, uh, I uh, was, a, as I say, a, a strong critic of the Democratic Party as well as the Republican Party. Next, a call from Studs Terkel's hometown of Chicago. Go ahead, please. Okay, uh, sir, do you believe that the Second Amendment gives individuals the right to keep and bear arms, both to defend themselves from violent criminals and from the government if necessary? Well, uh, you know, the Second Amendment, uh, which talks about the right to bear arms, uh, I'm not sure that the Second Amendment was intended to carry over into a time like the present when these very high velocity, very dangerous weapons, uh, not just used for hunting and not just used for self-defense, uh, uh, are circulating in this country to huge numbers of people. And uh, uh, I mean, from my point of view, the question is not how you interpret the Second Amendment, because I've, I've never believed that, that you decide what is right by what is written in the laws of the Constitution. The most important thing is what you think morally is right. And, um, and I really don't like the idea of guns uh, in the hands uh, of so many people in this country. After all, this country has one of the worst records in the world in terms of violent crimes. Now, you compare the murders and, vi and crimes of violence committed in this country uh, against uh, crimes of violence committed in other countries, and, and it's shocking. And, and these other countries that have less violent crimes are countries that do not have so many guns dispersed among their population. So uh, I don't like the idea of policemen having guns either, frankly. Uh, I think, uh, you know, I think uh, the policemen who are armed with all of these weaponry uh, have a tendency then to use them more readily. In fact, it's generally true of weaponry, whether it's in the hands of individuals or police or governments. It's like our government. It has all this weaponry and wants to use it. And uh, no, I, we, I think we ought to move towards disarmament. Disarmament of the population, disarmament of the police, disarmament of governments. Not just the Iraqi government, which certainly should be disarmed, but our government, which should be disarmed, and other governments. Is that realistic, though? N no, it's not realistic. <laughs> not in the short run, but I think it's something to keep in mind. Uh, there are a lot of things that are not realistic and that they're not going to be attained very quickly, but they're good ideals to work for because they throw light on current policies. Cheyenne, Wyoming is next with Howard Zinn. Yes, sir. Well, what do you think of... Uh Ford buying Jaguar and uh, Daimler buying Chrysler, and I think Ford also bought Volvo. Do you think that's good or bad for the country? Well, you know, what you're talking about is all these, you know, mergers and, and the, the creation of, of larger and larger and larger corporate entities. It's not good. It's certainly not good for the country. The more concentration of wealth, the more concentration of power there is, uh, the more powerless is the consumer who has to deal with, with corporations of overwhelming power. I mean, an example of this is, is the media, where uh, we used to have a lot more independent media than we have now, a lot more independent newspapers, more possibilities on television. Now you have a few giant companies uh, controlling our major television stations, our major newspapers. Uh, this is not good for democracy. Another email. How successful was the civil rights movement? You know, this is a question that is debated every time civil rights workers from the 60s get together and have a reunion and talk about the movement that we were all involved in. And I've been at a number of these reunions, and that issue always comes up. And the reason it comes up is that there's no clear-cut answer to it. The reason there's no clear-cut answer to it is that it's obvious that racism still exists, that segregation still exists, that the, you know, that the 
poor of the country and the homeless of the country and the people in the jails of this country are disproportionately black and and also Hispanic and and so if you take that as a measure of success of the civil rights movement you would conclude uh, no the civil rights movement didn't accomplish anything because look what we still have but you can also look at the fact that there has been change in this country as a result of the civil rights movement. Uh, legal segregation did end in the South. There are more black people in offices of power in the South. There are more black people uh, who uh, have some opportunity to do something in the South. Uh, there are more black people in professions. There are more you know, or more black kids going to college and so on. Uh, there, more than that, even though those things, you know, have to be measured against what I was just talking about, the persistence of racism uh, in this country. I think what is more important is that the civil rights movement created a spirit of resistance. The spirit of the, the, the civil rights movement was an example to any present or future movement. It suggested that you could get together and overcome enormous odds. And even if you didn't completely solve a problem, obviously the problem of racism has not been solved, even if you didn't completely solve a problem, you could change the consciousness of a nation, <coughs> excuse me, uh, which I think happened in the 60s as a result of the movement. The first Sunday of every, every month, we spend three hours with leading American authors. Today, our guest is Howard Zinn, and you can get further schedule information by logging on to cspan.org or booktv.org, either of our websites, Washington, D.C. Good afternoon. Good day, gentlemen. Thank you, Mr. Zinn, for your work, and I hope more people read your books. You've done a great job. Mm, uh, there's lots of things I'd like to comment on. Uh, like a better definition of socialism would be the pooling resources to get a lowest cost for services by using the largest leverage with a public court system for redress of grievances. Water supplies, libraries, fire departments, these are all socialist systems. Uh, socialism, communism, and capitalism are parts of all economic systems. And Einstein said the individual has the most freedom under socialism, just as Europe does now. Canada and Australia are all socialist systems. And capitalism exists in these, in these places. Uh, here, we have a medical system that you pay ten times more than a socialist system like Canada has with, uh, would cost. And, uh, why? Because the insurance companies insure the hospitals that have to give out free medicine, and it's ten times the cost. These people are eventually sick. They're not like CEOs or corporations getting the testing yearly, like an annual checkup that keeps costs ten times less. And they end up in emergency rooms where it's, you know, tremendous cost. Your insurance companies get the tax dollars, and it's very profitable for them. This is why they fight against a better system. Uh, the caller makes a very interesting point, an important point that here in this so-called capitalist uh, society, we have little pockets of socialism. We don't want to call socialism, because if we call them socialism, people say, hey, that's good. You know, that is, you know, there, uh, the educational system where, you know, the money for the educational system comes out of the general taxes. There are public institutions, the fire, the, the fire departments, the police departments, the sanitation departments, the things that are, are done by the government and, and that are paid for out of the public treasury. We could do the same thing with health care. We could do the same thing with housing. Uh, by the way, uh, congressmen and senators are the beneficiaries of socialist of socialism, socialized medicine. They, they have free medical care. They have what they will not give to the rest of the country. They're taken care of. Uh, no problems with insurance companies, with forms and so on. Uh, and by the way, the army has socialized medicine. I mean, when I was, when I got sick with pneumonia, when I was in the Air Force and, and training in, in Santa Ana, California, I, I, when I got pneumonia, I, I you know, I was treated and got the best possible treatment there was. I didn't have to think about paying for it. People in the, in the military don't have to think about paying for it. They, they're taken care of. That is socialized medicine. So, uh, you know, we are, the, the caller has a you know, very 
thought-provoking point. Where does the name Zin come from? Where are your forefathers from? Well, uh, let's see. Well, my f the name is Zin. Um, my father came from the Austro-Hungarian Empire, probably the Polish part of it. Now, Zin seems to be a German name. That is, most of the Zins that I've run into come from, their ancestors come from Germany. I mean, some people, when they see my name, they think it was, it's been shortened from <laughs> something. But no, it was Zin, been Zin as long as, as we can trace back. And uh, so my parents were Jewish immigrants. My father from, as I say, from the Austro-Hungarian Empire. My mother came from Asiatic Russia, from Siberia, Irkutsk. Um, um, but I, I, I remember getting a letter from somebody who offered to take me on a tour of castles in Germany uh, that belonged to uh, the Zinn clan in Germany, uh, thinking that you know, my, my forefathers must have been very wealthy. What was your first teaching job? My first teaching job was at Uppsala College in East Orange, New Jersey. It was a sort of part-time teaching job while I was still a graduate student at Columbia. But my first real teaching job uh, was at Spelman College in Atlanta, where I taught for seven years, and uh, uh, which was a wonderful educational experience for me. I think my, I learned more from those seven years teaching uh, black women at Spelman and living with my wife and kids in a black community and becoming involved in the movement. I learned certainly more during those seven years than my students learned from me. I had some wonderful students. This email from a viewer in Jersey City, New Jersey, who wants to know, are today's youth less informed and less interested in these issues than their predecessors? Today's young people? Um, well, I th I'm afraid that might be true <laughs> for a very large number of young people uh, simply because the main source of information for young people seems to be television. And television is terribly miseducational. I mean, and uh, terrorism gives young people a huge dose of trivia, violence, and the words of our national leaders and their, their excuses for whatever they're doing in the world. So there's a huge amount of misinformation that gets down to our young people. On the other hand, there is also, there also exists in society, and so that makes the answer to the question more complex. There also exist today more sources of information, more books, um, you know, more, more, when I first wrote People's History, there weren't a lot of books uh, that I would call People's History books. Uh, there were enough for me to use, for instance, as sources. But today there are many, many more books on women's history and black history, Native American history, and uh, gay and lesbian history, much more literature like that available. Uh, so you have these two things going side by side, more control, uh, in general, and yet, you know, uh, more dissident voices. When and under what circumstances did you leave Spelman College? <laughs> well, I left Spelman College in 1963. Uh, I'm, I'm smiling because it's always fun to be fired. Um, I didn't think so at the time. But, um, yeah, I, I, when you said under what circumstances, I have to tell you the truth. I was fired uh, in my uh, in, in my memoir, You Can't Be Neutral on a Moving Train, I have a, a chapter uh, which is entitled, I think, um, It's Not Terrible to Be Fired. Uh, and I was fired from Spelman because, well, the president of Spelman College began to see me as a troublemaker. Maybe I was. But he probably exaggerated the, the degree to which I was a troublemaker. That his students were rebelling. First, they were rebelling against segregation in the city. And then after they, you might say, they came out of jail for protesting racial segregation, they protested against the conditions of Spelman College in which they were treated very, very uh, ignominiously. They were treated <coughs> very patronizingly. They, 
<coughs> their lives were controlled, their movements were controlled, <coughs> and, uh, and so they rebelled against the kind of feudal system that existed in the Southern Black Women's College, and I supported them in that. And when I supported them in that, the president, I suppose, began to think that, you know, I was instigating them. But of course, you know, it's very rare that faculty instigate student revolts. It's the students who revolt, and then if there are faculty who support them, the faculty goes along. And really, that's the situation that I was in. Seattle, Washington, for Howard Zinn. Hi, Mr. Zinn. My question Hi. is this. Um, I'm going to be going to law school next year. Now, um, I guess I just want to know um, what someone in the legal profession can do to um, further a more socially just society, a more um, socialist society, uh, simply a more fair society. Thanks. Where are you going to school? Caller? Yeah. yeah. Where are you going to go to law school? Um, I don't know yet. I'm still <laughs> blind. Okay. <laughs> uh, well, no, uh, uh, good question because there, there are a lot of a lot of young people who uh, are interested in social change, have s strong views on 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 the world, and and yet and who want to go to law school and wonder if one can uh, be useful for the other. I guess the first point I would make is something you probably know and that is law schools are dangerous places for people with social consciences. Uh, you know, the, the law school does its best to, to draw you into the world of contracts and torts and corporation law and real estate law and insurance law and does its best to get you a job with a big law firm, you know, that will, that will work on making money. So uh, law schools, uh, you know, can be dangerous that way. So it means that anybody with a social conscience doesn't mean you shouldn't go to law school. It means you you should be wary and and uh, if and you should enter law school with a very strong sense of self and a very strong sense of your own political convictions, so you can withstand the pressures of law school. But once once you understand that, well, lawyers can do, a, do, I think, a lot. When I was contemplating, as I was going to college under the GI Bill, when I was contemplating what I would do with this education, I, I didn't know whether I would be a teacher or a lawyer. And one of my heroes was Clarence Darrow, who def, you know, defended all, all of these labor leaders and, and radicals and dissenters. And, and um, I thought of law I, I didn't realize how isolated Clarence Darrow was, how few Clarence Darrows there were. But there are lawyers who do marvelous things on behalf of civil rights, on behalf of equality. Lawyers who defend uh, prisoners, who defend uh, people who are, who are falsely or sometimes even truly accused of crimes. Uh, lawyers who defend radicals who are going to be made victims of the system. Uh, and we have wonderful, wonderful examples of that. Our next call comes to us from Dearborn, Michigan. Hello, Professor. Hello. You've become one of my uh, heroes this afternoon. Could you tell me, Professor, uh, how you feel we can get a just uh, and comprehensive peace in Palestine? I'd like to hear your comments, and, and uh, I'm, I'll go right back to my television to listen. Well, um, a just peace in Palestine. Uh, well, one thing, is, one thing is clear and probably, you know, so, sort of so obvious I shouldn't have to say it, and that is, you know, terrorism exists on both sides, you know, uh, and sure, and there, there are the suicide bombers on the one hand, and then there's the terrorism of the Israeli government on the other hand. Uh, a terrorism which existed even before the suicide bombers, because the terrorism comes in part from overt violence and in part from simply a ruthless control of several million Palestinians living in countries that were taken by Israel in the war of 1967. And the, the solution of the fundamental solution has to be uh, Israeli withdrawal from the occupied territories. and and it has to be total. It can't be, you know, hinged around and, and, and 
compromise with, oh, we'll, we'll give them this percentage of, of their own land or that. But no, uh, Israel has to get out of land that, that Israel uh, does not belong in because that is Palestinian land. Sure, Jewish settlers moved in there. The Israeli government moved settlers in there to try to try to give them a stronger and stronger hold, but those settlers are still a minority, and those settlers will just have to leave, as, as was done before when, when Israel you know, uh, came to a settlement with Egypt in the Sinai Peninsula, and there were Jewish settlers there. And the, Israel is at peace with, has been at peace with Egypt all these years, uh, but one of the conditions uh, for return of the Sinai Peninsula is the Jewish settlers had to leave. So, the, I mean, the, the the grounds for a settlement are very clear. Israel just has to get out. Now, how is this going to be achieved? Well, it's not going to be achieved by, by violence on either side, uh, although I believe in nonviolent resistance uh, uh, on the part of the Palestinians. Uh, and, uh, uh, and the United States certainly isn't helping, uh, you know, when, when Bush sees Sharon. Of course, Sharon is a kind of, you know, uh, you might say a carbon copy on a smaller scale of Bush himself, believing that violence solves problems. Uh, you know, the Bush administration and uh, generally American administrations have given their support to Israel in its occupation uh, of Palestinian land. This, the, so the, the solution is not going to come from the United States. It's going to have to come from the international community. It has to come from the United Nations. Uh, and, uh, and it will have to come by imposing on Israel uh, the necessity, the absolute necessity, of getting out of these occupied territories. I mean, we went to war against Iraq so that Iraq could get out of Kuwait. No. And uh, if we, you know, and he, here is a, a similar principle involved. And I'm not suggesting we've got a war over this, but I'm suggesting you know that this is a, that kind of a wrong. Howard Zinn and his wife live in the uh, Boston suburb of Ashburnville, about 20 minutes. Auburndale. Uh, Auburndale, <laughs> 20 minutes west of Boston. We'll show you the uh, study where Howard Zinn does most of his work as we get a call from Las Vegas. Good afternoon. Hello. Now listen, sir, I have to say that I think the majority of the stuff you're saying is totally ridiculous. I mean, number one, you said that most of the, the wars are fought by blacks, which is totally asinine. World War I and World War II were fought by whites, the majority. In the Iraqi war, I didn't see one black fighter pilot that was, that was shot down. And another, let me say this, too. In this country, what made this country great was its technological advances, okay? Now, I've always heard this story about, you know, when are the blacks and the Hispanics going to get their fair, fair share of the American dream? Well, they'll get it when they do their fair share of the scientific invention, the scientific discovery. They don't do anything. Why does it always take a white guy to make something? Then he has to invest his own money in the corporation to make the corporation strong. Then when it finally does get strong... You know, you people like you come and say, hey, give them their fair share of this country. They're not doing anything in this country. There's no great inventors. And let me ask you this. How come you college professors and you deans, you always get up there and you're, you're like white male psychophants that are willing to patronize everybody in order to be popular. Why don't you guys stand up and say, you know what, I'm going to resign from my job and give it to a black man. How come you didn't resign from your job and give it to a black man if you're so much for diversity? Well, <laughs> that's, that's, a, that's a nice barrage. Um, and... First of all, on, on this question of black people fighting in wars, I mean, I mean sure, it's, it's, it's true that, you know, in, uh, you know, in World War I, World War II, you know, you didn't see black soldiers playing a major role. Well, because black soldiers were kept in the background, black soldiers were segregated, and black soldiers were not, you know, allowed to hold important posts, uh, and uh, black soldiers was still segregated when we made war in the Philippines, but black soldiers were an important part of the occupational force in the Philippines. But when I was talking about black soldiers bearing the brunt of our wars, I was, I was thinking about recent wars, and I was thinking about the fact that in Vietnam, a disproportionate number of the people who served in Vietnam and a disproportionate number of the casualties in Vietnam were black people, people of color. Uh, now, it's not a matter of black versus white. Of course, white people died too. And, and, uh, and when I talk about black people being oppressed in this country, white people are oppressed too. Uh, but uh, there's no question that, that the uh, oppression of black people has been greater. 
and you talk about, you know, what have black people contributed? You know, sort of I get in your question, is there some notion that black people are in naturally inferior to white people? I mean, this is a, a kind of the kind of statement, you know, that we thought we would put to rest when we when Hitler disappeared for the scene, but obviously the notion has not been put to rest. You know, it's still, it's still there. I mean, uh, uh, black people have not been given the opportunities uh, to develop the, you know, the, the kind of skills and scientific training that whites pe white people have been given. Uh, they came out of slavery. Uh, then they were segregated for a hundred years. Uh, they have been kept in the poorest part of the population. They've always been discriminated against in jobs, and still are today. Uh, and then you ask, you know, why can't they do what whites do? And, but in fact, you know, most, most whites do not fit the image you give of people who, uh, you know, they're the technological and scientific leaders of, of society. You know, most whites, are like blacks, have been working people. They've been, um, while not enslaved, they, you know, they, you know, have been slaves of, of industry. And uh, uh, so, you know, I, I believe that blacks and whites together must, must work to uh, make this a, a more just world. Vienna, Virginia. Good yes, afternoon. Um, good afternoon. Um, first of all, I wanted to um, thank Professor Zinn for being such a wonderful person and uh, clear-sighted thinker. Um, he, Noam Chomsky, and Ralph Nader are in my pantheon of leaders, uh, voices of reason, um, who unfortunately don't get much publicity. Um, now, uh, I am an activist. I'm active in the anti-corporate globalization movement, and uh, I appreciate Professor, Zinn, Professor Zinn's urging of people to become more socially active. That is indeed the only way that, that we will have a better world. Um, uh, I uh, also educated myself by being an activist. I actually originally worked for the Clinton campaign back in 1992, and uh, have become more and more radicalized the more things that I've seen. Uh, my question for Professor Zinn regards his comment about um, the way the United States controls uh, economic policies of, of foreign countries. Um, we have a protest coming up on September 28th here in Washington against the International Monetary Fund and World Bank. And um, there is a controversy within the movement which I characterize as the Gandhians versus the Gaivarans. That is, uh, people who favor tactics of Gandhi versus people who favor the tactics of Che Guevara, who I suppose you could say um, was in favor of armed insurrection. So and I, which end of the spectrum do you come down on, Collar? Um, my experience has been um, that I, I continue to support the Gandhian uh, point of view, um, uh, but I, I will admit that uh, in several um, um, debates with people that I have been persuaded for one moment or another that the Gavarin would be the way to go. I'll stop you there. Thank you for the call. Mm. Howard's in. Well, uh, Gandhi versus Che Guevara, that's an interesting juxtaposition. Um, uh, but armed struggle, uh, in the United States um, and th thinking about economic justice, thinking about the environmental movement, thinking about the IMF and the World Bank and, and what, you know, American control of, of those institutions that have done to, to hurt uh, people in other countries. Thinking of the uh, struggles in Seattle, the um, great demonstrations in Seattle, Philadelphia, Washington, these were not armed struggles, but they were uh, militant in a sense that people took to the streets and and, and you know, and and people blockaded. People did what was done in in the civil rights movement. Of course, the newspapers, as politicians, as usual, focused on the few people who broke windows and did stuff like that. But uh, you know, I, I'm not going to choose between Gandhi and, and Che Guevara, except that I, I I don't believe in armed struggle. I don't believe in passivity. If if it's suggested that Gandhi believed in passivity, and he didn't really, of course, because Gandhi, Gandhi led struggles in India, which involved mass demonstrations confronting the police, struggles which often led to violence, although Gandhi did not believe in violence. Uh, I prefer to, to sort of 
characterize you know, my position on how to rebel, how to achieve social change, as a, a belief in nonviolent direct action, uh, which was the, f the expression used by the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, expression used in the South by the movement, expression used by Martin Luther King. And uh, nonviolent direct action is not passivity. Nonviolent direct action means that you, you don't initiate violence. But it's, it's not a good idea. It's not pragmatic, and it's probably hurtful, and it's probably morally wrong. People uh, get hurt wrongly, and, and probably you ju uh, just brings down the enormous power of the state against you and maybe lead to crushing of movement. So it's neither pragmatic nor moral, but certainly the answer is not passivity. The answer is action, uh, demonstrative action, protest, boycotts strikes, even sabotage, that is, uh, you know, I, I have nothing, I, actually, I don't have anything against uh, uh, what sometimes is characterized as violence, which is against things, uh, uh, that is against property, against, you know, a fence, or a door, <laughs> or a railroad track, or wh whatever, uh, you know, a, a war machine, a nuclear uh, a plant that makes nuclear weapons. I mean, we have many, you know, people in recent years, the Plowshares 8 and the other people uh, who have uh, gone into sort of plants manufacturing parts of nuclear weapons and, and sort of done symbolic, like, smashing of, of little things here and there. So uh, are you advocating that as a form of symbolism or as some massive destruction of property? Uh, did you say massive destruction? Mass if you're well, going to go in and destroy train tracks or destroy a building well, well, or no, break think, a window. Well, I think there are times that, well, you know, simply for people to, to, who demonstrate and go down the street breaking windows, no, I'm, I'm not in favor of that. Uh, you know, of course, it's, that's always presented as a much more serious thing than the violence that, you know, that authorities do, but I'm not, I'm not in, in favor of that. But, you know, if you... Uh, you know, ask, uh, uh, sure, there are uh, times, you know, for instance, during the Vietnam War when, you know, people might uh, go into draft boards and destroy draft records. They might break into a building, you know, and de destroy draft records, which is, you know, you might say an act of violence. Not a violence against human beings, but an, an act of protest against the war. And, and in recent years, you know, like the plowshares, eight and other people like that who have gone into places uh, that manufacture weaponry and uh, done little acts of, you know, of damage to, to express their protest against a military machine. I think that's justified and good. I, I don't believe in violence against human beings. Tucson, Arizona. Uh, hello, Professor Zen. Yes. Um, I'm ashamed to say I haven't read of any of your books, but this will change very soon. I have a story from uh, my high school days back in Egypt where I grew up about my history teacher that I thought might be uh, nice to, to uh, contribute. I used to hate history. My strength was in math and in uh, <coughs> foreign languages. But uh, one day we had this new history teacher who came in. He was supposed to teach us modern Egyptian history. He started talking about the royal family and the great contributions they have done, and then suddenly stopped and said, do you really want me to repeat what's in the book, or do you want to hear the real history? We said, we would like to hear the real history. He said, close the door and come up front so that I don't have to speak too loudly. And then he already told us about the, uh, how they were draining the uh, country's economy, how they got the country in debt, where it would end up being colonialized by, uh, by England. Sorry, my, <laughs> my voice is wearing a little bit. And I, I cannot forget that. That man put himself in great danger uh, just to give us an honest assessment of what it was really like. I'll stop you uh, there. Thank you, caller. Yeah, well, that's that, that's a, a very interesting story, and and it's uh, instructive because you know, yeah, th that's what a, a real teacher is. A real teacher is somebody who puts aside the traditional texts and tells it like it is, and talks about what's going on and, and what really is going on, and gives students, you know, an alternative and exciting and vibrant history which might motivate them to act. 
Valdosta, Georgia, good afternoon. Hi, uh, Professor Zinn, it's a real thrill to be able to talk to you. Uh, I've been teaching here at Valdosta State for the last 14 years. What do you teach? I've been, using, uh, been teaching history, uh, and in my survey text I've used um, the people's history ever, ever since I've been teaching. Uh, I had a two-part question for you, well, actually two different questions. Uh, one had to do with the influence of, uh, of your parents. Were they politically aware or class conscious at all? Uh, and the second had to do kind of a self-serving question. Since I'm one of the authors in the, um, the People's History series, uh, but just wanted to know what the, uh, what the status of the series was right now. How many uh, books do we have forthcoming, and, um, and what, what are we looking for in that? Well, that sounds suspiciously like a Professor David Williams. I think you, you pegged me. Uh, and uh, of Valdosta, Georgia, yeah, Valdosta State University. And uh, uh, answer to your first question uh, is, uh, no, my parents were not political people at all. They, they're just, you know, workers, the factory workers. Uh, my father moved up from being a factory worker to being a waiter. <laughs> and. Uh, a pushcart peddler, the this and that, a window cleaner, and uh, no, they uh, they had they were not very well educated. You know, my father had a fourth grade education. My mother had a seventh grade education. They, they, and uh, uh, so no, there were no books in the house. In fact, uh, really, uh, although when they saw me starting to read books, they they encouraged me and they even bought books for me, books which they had no idea what the books were about, but they thought a book is a book. And uh, and uh, so no, uh, I guess the extent of their political interest was the fact that they they thought that Roosevelt was a good man uh, because he was helping the poor. Uh, that was it. But no, I didn't get any of my radical ideas from them. Uh, um, as for the status of the, of the, the series, we we are doing uh, the 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 new press, uh, which is an independent publishing outfit in New York, is doing a, a series of people's histories uh, uh, of, well, and, it, well, we've just started, really, so we, we, we have already a people's history of the American Revolution by Ray Raphael, a quite wonderful book, a, a, a book about the American Revolution different from any book on the American Revolution you've ever read. Uh, and we, we are planning, in, you know, a number of other books which look at parts of American history and even world history from a people's point of view. And Professor David Williams, uh, the caller, is in fact, we've contracted with him to do a people's history of the Civil War, which is an exciting uh, prospect uh, because the Civil War is so often presented to us, you know, from the top down, you know, the battles that were fought in Grant and Lee and, and Lincoln and the Confederacy. and and uh, and uh, it's time we had a, a view of the Civil War, and David Williams, uh, I, I believe, is going to give us that a view of the Civil War from the bottom up, from the ordinary people of the South and the North. And uh, I mean, that's as far as we've gotten in the series. We're waiting for more, more possible people's histories of this and that. And you begin this book with a different perspective of Christopher Columbus than many may have learned in grade school or high school? How, how, why so different? Well, uh, I must confess that when I first started to write this book, People's History, uh, you know, I, I guess I wrote it in the late 70s and came out in 1980, 81. Uh, I knew very little about Christopher Columbus. I knew what all, all of us learn in grammar school and, uh, you know, that Christopher Columbus discovered America. <laughs> And the Nina and the Pinta and the Santa Maria and, and et cetera, et cetera, and you know, great adventurer, great navigator, et cetera, and so on. Uh, but then, when I knew that I was writing a different kind of history, I knew that I was going to write history from not from the point of view of the important people, the conquerors, but from the point of view of the victims and the, and the resistors. And so I began to look. Who are the victims of Columbus? Who are the resistors? And then I came across the writings of Bartolome de las Casas, the Spanish priest who, who wrote multi-volume history of what the Spaniards, Columbus and the others, did in the Indies. Uh, and it was shocking uh, what they did to the, these very peaceful Indians, the Indians who greeted Columbus when he came 
to the Bahamas, they, you know, they greeted him peacefully, and he, but he came with the sword. He came with these dogs, these ferocious attack dogs. He came with firearms, and, uh, and uh, he, uh, he was in search of gold. He wasn't simply a, a scientific navigator, adventurer. You know, he was, he was uh, a greedy man, a greedy for his financiers back in Spain. And, and in search of gold, he kidnapped Indians. He enslaved them. He mutilated them. He killed them. And so I, I decided, no, that's the story I must tell. Houston, Texas. You're on the air with Howard Zinn. Thank you. Hello. And I would just like to hear your view on um, how our presidential campaign should be financed in this country. And also, I was wondering if you see any connection between the way our political leaders are financed and what happened on September 11th, because I see a direct connection. Oh, well, I'd, I'd like to know from you, what is the connection you see? Well, let, let me ask you about how, because oh. the, the caller had hung up, how campaigns oh. should be financed. Oh, oh. Well, I suppose the basic principle of, of financing is that it should uh, be public financing and not private financing. It, sh it shouldn't be candidates get financed according to, you know, how much money they can raise from corporations. Uh, candidates should have equal access to television, should have equal access to newspapers. In other words, the, the citizens of the country should uh, be given the democratic opportunity to view the, the issues and the ideas of not just the two major candidates, but of all the candidates. So, yeah, funding should be public, it should be democratic, and it should be removed from, from corporate control. Uh, Can you draw any connection between September 11th and campaigns in this country, well, how they're financed, or the candidates themselves? Well, I, I can draw a connection between, certainly between uh, Bush as president and, and, and corporate financing since, uh, you know, but th that wouldn't tell you a lot because Gore, his opponent, was also financed to a great extent by corporations, you know. And what's the difference between the Republicans and the Democrats? The Republicans hold dinners in which, you know, you have to pay $400,000 uh, to get the attention of the president and Democrats, uh, well, you only have to pay $300,000. But uh, Bush, Bush is, is the president of the corporations, and Gore also, and Lieberman also, the president of the corporations. So, I mean, what that connection is with September 11th, uh, you know, I don't know, uh, unless you want to say, uh, and I suppose it's possible to say that, you know, terrorism has its roots in American foreign policy, and American foreign policy has, <laughs> uh, American foreign policy has its roots in the extension of American corporate power around the world. You touched on this earlier, but Matt Damon's name continues to come up on this program. I've heard rumors for years that you have been working on a Fox miniseries based on a people's history with Matt Damon. Any truth? Some truth. <laughs> that is, we started out, Matt Damon and Ben Affleck and I and Chris Moore, a fourth person, uh, we started out uh, contracted with Fox Television to do a series of television movies based on episodes from a people's history. Fox dropped out of the project after a couple of years. And now HBO has taken it on. And right now, we, uh, Matt Damon, Ben Affleck, Chris Moore, I, are working with HBO. Uh, and the first scripts are being written. Uh, first script, in fact, is on Columbus and Las Casas uh, by uh, the Scottish uh, writer Paul Laverty. Uh, that, that script is being written. And then another script on the American Revolution, uh, different take on the American Revolution by Paul Lussier, uh, that script is being written. So we have two scripts being written. If these scripts, uh, well, if HBO likes these scripts, uh, then they will make movies of them and then turn to more episodes from the book. But it's a very long, what I've discovered in my short history with Hollywood is that it's, it's a, a long, drawn-out process. You have to be very patient and you can't have too many illusions. So if somebody asked me, what are the chances of this happening? I don't know. <laughs> Rupert Idaho, you're next. Good afternoon. Hello. 
Hello. Yes. Uh, my main question is, if you're familiar with Hawaiian sovereignty and what your perspective is, and then uh, I'm curious, when you're talking about the media, what you think about C-SPAN and what you feel like it does really well and what you might like to see done more of. Oh, oh, oh thank you. Hawaii, uh, well, you know, I can't say I'm, a, I'm an expert on Hawaii, I, but I know there's been a movement by the indigenous people of Hawaii who've been overwhelmed by, by, you know, by other people coming in and certainly overwhelmed by, you know, American uh, politics and, and, and American uh, economic influence and the American military uh, taking over large parts of Hawaii. Uh, I mean, so much of the, you know, the land and beautiful land of Hawaii you know, been taken over by real estate developers and hotels and so on. So I know there's a movement by the indigenous people of Hawaii, you know, to get recognition and to try to stop the, this, uh, this uh, corporate and military control of this, this beautiful group of islands. So, you know, that's, that's how much I know uh, about what's going on in, in Hawaii. You probably obviously know a lot more about it. You should be on this program <laughs> answering that question. Um, but then uh, you, uh, you asked another question. Uh, what, what was She it? asked about C-SPAN. Oh, you asked about C-SPAN. Oh, yes, my, my, uh, but, but this program is my, never about my, us. My it's always about is you. too modest to raise the question of C-SPAN. Well, uh, uh, C-SPAN, and I'm not always to get always, always able to get C-SPAN. In fact, for a long time I wasn't able to get C-SPAN, but for a long time my wife and I didn't get cable at all. And then we realized that, you no, know, there are things on cable that you can't get on the regular networks, and C-SPAN is certainly one of them. The good things about C-SPAN that I've seen are the C-SPAN will cover events that aren't covered by the uh, major media and cover them totally. You know, they'll just plant a camera there while, uh, while people are having a, a, a a conference or a meeting and they'll just stick with it and you know they won't give you sound bites in three minutes and and then cut away to something else you know no commercials no uh, uh, none of that so a c-span and and I don't I don't know what proportion of time because I haven't seen enough I don't know what proportion of time c-span devotes to what I would call people's history that is the things that people do, as opposed to the things that, let's say, the politicians do or that business corporations do. But I know I've seen some very good things that C-SPAN has covered. And of course, book C-SPAN. Well, how, how can somebody who writes books say anything but favorable things about book C-SPAN? I mean, here I am talking about books, even my books, uh, for this length of time, and no, only C-SPAN would do it, so. How many are still in print, by the way? How many are still in print of these books? I swear, I don't know. Maybe four, five, six, seven, <laughs> eight. I don't, I don't know, but I can say this, that the ones that are out of print, and the ones that are out of print are the oldest ones, like SNCC and the book Disobedience and Democracy, and my book on LaGuardia, and uh, the Southern Mystique. Uh, the out of print books are now being reprinted by South End Press in Boston, which is one of the, the you know, these small independent publishers. Uh, so those out of print books are available now, as of now, from South End Press. Let me again just remind our audience a complete list of the uh, books by Howard Zinn available at booktv.org. Our next call is Miami, Florida. Good afternoon. Uh, hello, Mr. Zinn. Yes, hello. Um, I remember when you visited um, Florida State University when I was a student there. And I would just really like to thank you for um, your contribution as far as um, the perspective that you write history from. I, oh, I think you. a whole lot of people benefit from that. Thank you. Are you teaching today? No, I, I'm not teaching. I, I actually stopped teaching at Boston University, uh, mm, I don't know, 14 years ago. So I'm not teaching except in the sense that I'm, I'm doing a lot of speaking, public speaking, going around the country, speaking to community groups, high schools, colleges, uh, uh, and uh, so in a sense I'm, I, I consider myself a freelance teacher. Our last call from Laguna Beach, California. Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Zen, I'd like to ask you a pretty direct, simple question. What, what precisely is your political ideology? I, I assume it's 
leftist, is it socialist, anarchist, Marxist, combination? Where are you? Could you be very specific, and I'll hang up and listen. Ooh, well, that's a tough one. I hate to categorize myself, you know, too simply because it's so subject, you know, these things are so subject to interpretation, you know, if you say, oh, I'm a, he's a Marxist, what does that mean? So many people claim to be Marxists or socialists. Uh, but I consider myself, I, I like the ideas of anarchism that is in the, I read Emma Goldman, read Kropotkin, anarchism, lib, which is libertarian, which is anti-authority, and which is for equality. I like, I like those ideas. I like the ideas of socialism, which go along the same lines. Uh, but I certainly don't want any of these beliefs in anarchism or socialism to be read as a belief in, in centralized control. In fact, that's, anarchism does not believe in centralized control. I, I believe in, a, in what I would call democratic socialism. This uh, viewer from the Queens is asking specifically about uh, Ayn Rand's philosophy and how do you reconcile it with yours? Well, Ayn Rand's philosophy cannot easily be reconciled with mine because she seems to believe in a kind of uh, unbridled capitalism. You know, let let the market decide. Let you know, uh, you know, take the government out of regulating the economy, and everything will be all right. Well, we actually had that in the 19th century, and things were not all right. Howard Zinn, what's next for you? What's next for me? Ah. I don't know. I'm, I'm still, you know, involved. I'm still speaking. And, uh, I'm, I'm trying to deal with. I'm still writing for the Progressive and other places, and writing about what's going on now: a war in Iraq, possibly, and foreign policy, domestic policy. But personally, no. I'm interested in writing screenplays and working on this television series. I'm interested in writing a, a screenplay based on the the Ludlow Massacre, which I've been doing together with a, uh, two friends and writers from Britain, Naomi Wallace and Bruce McLeod. I'm, I'm uh, interested in writing a screenplay based on the life of Emma Goldman. Uh, so, uh, you, know, I'm, uh, you know, I'm looking for sort of different ways to write about history, uh, more dramatic ways, uh, in ways you know, perhaps that are more fun for me to write about. Professor? author, lecturer, columnist, Howard Zinn. We thank you for your time. Oh, thanks so much for having me here. You've been watching In Depth with Howard Zinn. If you missed any portion of the three-hour interview, you can see this program again at 5 p.m. Eastern